Okay, we're recording. Start by having a little mic here. Uh, good evening. It is February 5th, 2024. This is a regular meeting of the town council. The open meeting law allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present at a meeting location while providing the public with adequate access to the meeting. However, as you can see, there are many counselors in the room tonight and we welcome you all. Um, this meeting is accessible in real time via Zoom, by phone, and as a live broadcast on Amherst Media, Channel 9, and live streamed. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the February 5, 2024, regular town council meeting to order at 632. I will call upon each counselor by the name they have indicated that they would like to be addressed. At that time, please unmute your mic and say present. Please remember to mute your mic after saying present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Councillor Ette. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Councillor Haneke. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Councillor Lord. I know that she is having connectivity problems. Uh, Cam Rooney. Here. Councillor Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Jennifer, you need to unmute and say present. Uh, you're still muted. Uh, I'm sorry, you had zapped out for a minute. Present. That's fine. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Here. There is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know. Uh, and uh, to make a comment or ask a question, use the raised hand button. If technical difficulties arise as a result of utilizing remote participation, we will decide how to address the situation. And if necessary, um, make note of that or have to suspend the meeting. Uh, immediately after the announcements, we will move to a joint meeting with the remaining members of the Housing Authority for the purpose of selecting candidates or a candidate to fill two vacant seats. There will be general public comment at this meeting immediately following the joint meeting with the Housing Authority. If you're in the audience and you want to make general public comment, you have to sign in with Athena, who is over here at the desk. Thank you. Later on, I'll ask people in the audience to raise their hands for general public comment, but not at this time. So very quickly, uh, the announcements on the agenda. As you can see, we have a council meeting. Um, I don't think February 15th is a council. It's the 26th. Thank you. Um, and March 4th, we will have a regular town council meeting as well. At that time, we'll have a public forum on the Community Preservation Act funding. Um, as you can also see on the calendar, I mean, or on the um, agenda, all the committees have now been formed of the council and they are meeting. I wanna call attention to the various events regarding Black History Month please continue to check the town's website. Specifically, there is um, an exhibit on the Black experience in Amherst in Town Hall, some of which is right outside the door here. The Spring Festival Lunar New Year celebration will be on February 17th. It starts at 1030 and uh, goes into the afternoon at the Amherst Regional Middle School. With that, I'm going to um, move to the joint meeting with the Amherst Housing Authority and Vice President Anna Devlin Gothier will conduct this portion of the meeting. Thank you. All right, so we are, first off, does the Housing Authority need to call themselves to order if they don't have a? They have a quorum. You do have a quorum, amazing. Um, if the Housing Authority would like to call your meeting to order, that would be great. I think they do. Hold on. I wasn't sure. I was trying to count. Uh, James Linfield is on Zoom. Yes. Thank you. 
that will do it. Um, is that who am I turning this? Who's the so is it David? David? Here. David, would you like to call your meeting to order, please? Um, if you could hold the button down on your microphone. If you could call your meeting to order and um, make sure everyone on the Housing Authority can hear you and be heard. You have to hold it the whole time. It's it's pesky. Great. Again. Again. <laughs> Thank, the deputy please. Thank you. I am Mark Barrett. I'm on the member. As a member. Thank you. And I think James only has to unmute. Oh, James, I think you're still muted. Uh, James Linfield, um, housing, uh, Board of Housing Commissioner, I guess. Thank you for joining us. And um, Athena, if you could bring Michael Burkhart in to the room, that would be great. So as a reminder, we are here to appoint one of the uh, remaining members of the Amherst Housing Authority. Thank you to the current members of the Housing Authority for engaging in this process with us. Uh, we will be, uh, we've received one uh, statement of interest for this position. And so I'd like to thank Michael Burkhart, who has joined us today, uh, who has uh, served in the past in this role and will be, um, will be speaking with us tonight. So are we ready to move forward? Oops, okay. So, okay. Athena, excuse me, Athena, please take the agenda down. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. And I lost Michael. Michael, welcome. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? I sure can. All right. So we have prepared a set of six questions that uh, were in the packet for tonight. And with your permission, we'd love to hear your responses. Um, we'll start with if you have a two-minute opening statement that you'd like to say for the uh, for the sake of clarity of what's going to happen here. We're going to go through the question and answer. We will have a um, time for public comment as well before we make our final vote on the on appointing the the new member. All right. So, Michael, would you like to make a uh, opening statement of up to two minutes? Thank sure. you for the time, uh, Athena. I think I joined the, the commission back in 2017. <clears throat> and um, I did not take out papers last November. Uh, last year was the worst year of my life. I lost three friends I've known for 30 and 40 years. And uh, the last one was dying actively in November. And I didn't have any energy to go get 150 signatures. So uh, I've come out of the other end of that. And I uh, would like to, given that there's a, a position, like to rejoin the housing authority. Uh, it takes a long time to, is there feedback or? Am I... Yes, we're taking I'm... care of it. Okay, should I continue or wait? I, I think. I think if you're comfortable continuing, we can, we can understand you. Um, that's if that's fine. okay. Thank you. Oh yeah. Um, this is a very regulated institution. It's not like a regular board of directors of a nonprofit. And there's a real long learning curve, not just to mention the stuff you all know about open meeting law and all those regulations. You have a housing authority that has antiquated buildings with antiquated heating systems. And, uh, you're, you're constantly having to do repair, not repairs, but replacement. And there's a whole... Uh, sequence that has to be followed carefully about that. The monthly meetings are really devoted to what I think is the key role for the commissioners, which is the financial oversight. And that's another learning curve to get on top of what that really means, as well as all the vendors. So you can pick up what, this is a new vendor, why are they here? So uh, I'm, I'm impressed with what a long learning curve that is. So I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you. You addressed this a, a bit in your opening statement, but we're going to jump into the questions. And again, if you can keep your responses to under two minutes, you did a phenomenal job on the opening statement. So question one, if you have anything else to add on this topic, why would you like to join the housing authority and what experience do you have with the AHA? And feel free if you feel like you already covered something to tell us that as well, that's fine. I think I pretty much covered that. I, um, I had a lot of years consulting to a large housing authority in Louisville, Kentucky. 
So I have a familiarity with uh, housing authorities that help. And I bring a background in organization development to understanding organizational dynamics. Thank you. How do you plan to establish a relationship with the chief executive and hold them accountable to the board's goals? Well, I think I I bring a relationship with the chief executive. I was I chaired the panel when we hired her, and have supported her uh, in a number of situations that uh, really mattered. I think we're, the accountability is a function of uh, what are the goals and what are the uh, things that have to be met in terms of regulations and other things. So that's it's not personal. It's we have to go over these things and you just do it. You, you know, you make sure that. You don't let any personal uh, relationships interfere with us having to ask the questions that have to be asked and look at the things that have to be examined. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Third question. What do you believe are the current strengths and weaknesses of the AHA? How will you build upon the strengths and address the weaknesses? Well, when uh, we hired Pamela, we found out to our dismay that in many ways, we were out of compliance with various regulations, and we had staff who did not have the required certifications. So I would say the first year was really trying to get back up to uh, par in that regard. And then, you know, it was incumbent on her to build a team, and some people were not really um, capable of doing what is required, so they had to be replaced. So it's been quite a while of trying to create a solid team. Also, those jobs are not highly sought after. It's not a population people are dying to work with, and the pay is fairly uh, minimal. So it's quite a challenge to constantly be able to have good staff. I think what we accomplished on the board was really, it was for the long time, it was just um, David and Nancy and myself, and we accomplished that. We didn't miss meetings for one of us being empty, I mean, being got, uh, away much at all. Am I at two minutes, does that say? Just about. Okay. Thank you. Question four, uh, thinking in general about the housing situation in Amherst, what thoughts do you have about how affordable housing might be increased? It's gonna demand somebody building things like we had with the uh, that single room occupancy, SRO, that's been uh, completed on Northampton Road. Um, other than that, I don't see the state doing a, there is some monies that we're aware of maybe becoming available. And if so, we're, we're definitely gonna bid for them. Uh, we have, our, our executive director is good at grants, good at administrating them. The other thing she did, she initiated was uh, something the housing authority is, in, the, the state is interested in is having larger housing authorities assume some management over smaller ones because they've really faced a challenge. If you're a small housing authority, you have funds because it's all controlled by the state to hire a plumber maybe, I mean, a maintenance person for uh, 14 hours, 18 hours a week, trying to compete in the market to get somebody who will contract with you for that small amount of time is really uh, like Sisyphus rolling the ball up the hill, it's almost impossible. So now that we have those agreements with uh, Hadley and Belchertown, we have a larger maintenance staff and we can rotate them across the three housing authorities. And I think that's made a big difference. Uh, our big challenge is dealing with this aging infrastructure. And yes, the state does uh, make available funds, but it's a long process and how you go through the bids, get the uh, architectural drawings and then get the thing built. And we're always, uh, as much as the state is doing that, we're really behind because the, the buildings are so antiquated in, their, uh, in how old they are, especially the heating systems. Thank you. You have addressed much of this already, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, what relevant experience do you bring to this role? And please provide specific examples as well as what you bring from those examples into this coming experience. Well, I bring uh, what, three, three, six, at least six years experience being on the board, of which five of them I was the chair of the board. Um, I understand organizational dynamics in terms of how you deal with conflict, 
between departments, between individuals. And that's, that, that's something that comes up. Um, sometimes it reaches our level and we have to uh, take a role in supporting the executive director and how that gets handled through the regulations. And uh, I think one of the things I'm bringing to this is and in, the intent to work with the executive director in getting our our um, our brand better out in the public. People don't think, don't really know what the Amherst Housing Authority does. They think we just uh, we deal with the homeless, and they don't understand that we're part of a state system that has a whole set of regulations. Just because somebody is in need or your friend doesn't mean they come to the head of the line. So everything's very regulated. Uh, and so we have a misperception out there of who we are and what we do. And we need to have that uh, connection with various community agencies because they're also a source uh, for people who need our work, need, need to have a place to come. Um, and they need to know what it is if somebody comes to them and is interested in getting a, a room, what the process is. So that will speed up their ability to meet with us and, and get moving on that. Uh, you have people in crisis, you have people with very little means often, and it's a lot of work having them be able to jump through the hoops they have to jump through in order to get a place or to get a voucher. Thank you. Our last question is, is there anything else you would like to add that you have not previously had the opportunity to share with us? The only thing I would add is, you know, in the last year with having James and Mark join us, uh, I think we've begun to build a team uh, where we work well together. And I, if I'm reappointed, I'd really look forward to continuing that process. Michael, thank you so much for putting your name forward again for this. Uh, that is the conclusion of our questions. We're going to move into a special period of public comments specifically about this appointment, um, not about other topics on the agenda, just about this appointment uh, before our deliberation and vote. But Michael, thank you very much. Um, and I think, Athena, we move, do we move Michael back to the audience or do we keep, yeah. So we're gonna move you back to the audience, um, but thank you very much. And you'll get to watch us now discuss this. <laughs> All right, so at this point, I'd like to ask if anyone has public comment specifically on this item, which is the uh, appointment to fill the vacancy on the Amherst Housing Authority public comment specifically on this item. If you're on Zoom, you can raise your hand. If you're in the room, um, you would tell Athena. Is there anyone in the room who signed up for public comment who wanted to speak on this issue? Thank you. Okay, great. We do have one hand on Zoom. So if we can go ahead and, and allow Jennifer Shao to speak. And Jennifer, you'll have up to two minutes to make your comment. Thank you. Thank you, this is Jennifer Shaw. I live in Amherst, and I just wanna speak in favor of Michael Burkhart for this appointment. Michael has um, lived in Amherst for a long time, has been involved with the community for a long time. In my experience, he's very measured and very thoughtful in all of his decisions and deliberations. And he looks at things through an equity lens. He looks at all things through an equity lens. So I think you would be lucky to have him on, uh, to have him on the Housing Authority, and I, I hope that you vote to appoint him. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands on Zoom and Athena, we didn't have anyone in the room, correct? All right, thank you. So with that, we will move to deliberation. Are there any comments from members of the council or members of the housing authority regarding this appointment? I'm seeing Lynn's hand. Thank you. First of all, Michael, thank you so much for putting your name forward and um, Sorry for the circumstances that led to us doing this this way, but we're glad to see you interested and back. I also want to use this opportunity to remind people that there is an additional seat open on the Housing Authority, and we will continue to advertise for that and go through the same process. Um, other than that, I have no other comment, but would be prepared to make a motion. All right. Any other comments? All right, um, I'm happy to, I can do, okay. So uh, I'd like to move to elect Michael Burkhart to registered voter in the town of Amherst to the Amherst Housing Authority for a term ending January 5th, 2026. Second. Thank you. 
All right, and I'm going to go ahead and call the vote. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. I am an aye. Councillor Ette? Aye. Lynn Griesmer? Aye. Councillor Haneke? Aye. Bob Hegner? Aye. Councillor Lord is absent. Uh, Pam Rooney? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Aye. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Mark Barrett? Yes. James Linfield? James, we did mute. Sorry, I think you're muted still. Yes. Thank you. I and David Williams? Yes. All right, that's a yes. It is unanimous with one absent, including the three members of the Amherst Housing Authority. Thank you very much and congratulations, Mr. Burkhart. We look forward to having you in, serve in this capacity again. Um, we are still looking for one name. So if you are passionate about affordable housing in Amherst, please, please consider putting your name forward for this opportunity. And with that, I will thank our members of the Housing Authority. Would you like to adjourn your meeting at 6.52? We do. Thank you. All right. Their meeting is adjourned. And Lynn, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Great. Nice job. Um, we are do not have any hearings tonight, but we are going to move to general public comment. If you're in the room and you want to make general public comment, you need to make sure you have registered with Athena. If you are in the audience and you want to make general public comment, please raise your hand at this time. Right now, I'm seeing four hands on Zoom, five, six, seven. Are there any other people on Zoom who would like to make public comment? I'm going to go with the number seven. Uh, Athena, can you tell me how many people have registered that are in the room? I think I have 20. Okay. Um, we are going to limit public comment to two minutes. That is the minimum that we can go. Uh, please, if you can make note when you just wanna reinforce something that maybe has already been said. Uh, residents are welcome to express their views for up to two minutes. The council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. Public comments are not reflective of the opinions of the town council and public comments relate and need to relate to the business of the town council. Um, with that, Athena, we're going to actually um, just give us a moment while we reorganize. We're going to start with the members in the town room. Uh, Jean, I'm sorry, Horrigan or Harrigan? Horrigan, thank you. And if you could just make sure the, the green light is on, press the button to speak and state your name and where you live before you begin. Thank you. My name is Jean Horrigan. I live in Precinct 3. Um, here as a member on the Council on Aging and a volunteer at the Senior Center. Last spring, the Senior Center launched the Silver Shuttle, an ADA transportation program for seniors in need of rides to medical appointments, grocery store, and the Senior Center. The Silver Shuttle was started thanks to a donation by PVTA coordinated by Representative Mindy Dom. ARPA funds are used to pay the salary of the driver. This service was sorely needed. Over 600 rides have been given since the shuttle took the road last May. Rides are available on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays between the hours of 9 and 3 p.m. Rides have been provided to over 50 unique individuals. The vast majority of rides are for medical appointments in Amherst, which had 67, Hadley with 73, and Northampton, 166, followed by trips to the grocery store 
and rides to and from the senior center to attend programs. The shuttle van is also used for trips which promote community and socialization for seniors, especially those who use walkers and wheelchairs. This service is a lifeline and also provides a wellness check on each rider. It's unfortunate that the shuttle isn't available full time since seniors have appointments every day of the work week. The ARPA funds do not allow for five days a week service. The Silver Shuttle operates 19 hours each week. Unless additional funding is provided, the Senior Center will be unable to continue the program. This would be very unfortunate considering virtually every other Senior Center in Hampshire County has a full-time driver and at least one ADA van, if not multiple. You have Amherst, 15 seconds. Amherst seniors need and deserve reliable, safe, and affordable transportation to maintain their independence and age in place. Please fund this critical service. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We're going to go to the audience. And uh, when you are enter the room, please state your name and where you live. Jennifer Shaw will be the first person brought in. Hello again, my name is Jennifer Shaw. I live in Amherst in District 5. I'm an employee at UMass Amherst and a member of the Professional Staff Union. I'd like to urge the town council members to vote in favor of the resolution that calls on the Massachusetts legislature to pass the CHERISH Act. The resolution speaks for itself in detailing the benefits of supporting Massachusetts public colleges and universities, and that doing so lifts Massachusetts residents, including people of color, first-generation college students, and other historically mar marginalized populations. And almost anything that supports public higher education will be good for the town of Amherst. The town of Amherst, your constituents, and the people who voted you into office are the students, staff, and faculty at UMass and their families. More support and greater access to public higher education means a stronger and healthier UMass Amherst. Passing the CHERISH Act would mean that the university would have more funds to invest in fixing and updating failing buildings which means a healthier work environment for employees and students. And it would mean better pay for employees whose annual pay increases have not kept up with inflation for years. In short, supporting this resolution is the right thing to do for residents of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and for the residents of the town of Amherst. I hope you'll vote in favor of it. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Back to the audience in the room. Jostar Reggie. Is the green light on? Oh, she has district one. Good evening. I'm here to draw the attention of the council and the community to the Amherst resolution for a ceasefire in Gaza, which I submitted to the council on January the 22nd as a community sponsor uh, on behalf of 200 plus more community sponsors with Councillor Pat DeAngelis as the initial councillor sponsor. The resolution is currently en route to the GOL committee to be reviewed at its next meeting on February 8th. And from there, it will come to the agenda of the February 26th town council meeting for your consideration and a vote. When we submitted the, res um, I'll skip in the interest of time. We see this resolution as a community building initiative one that allows all Amherst residents to feel safe and feel heard. I can testify that it is being welcomed with great relief by many of our townspeople, especially those who are the most affected by the ongoing onslaught in Gaza, whether they are Jewish, Muslim, Palestinian, or Arab Americans. We are doing all we can to set a respectful tone for the conversation and to acknowledge the feelings of our townspeople at a time when many of us are deeply distressed. Just one last point, how does this issue have a bearing on the town of Amherst? For me, its most immediate effect is the distinct chill in the air that silence and silencing bring, and the oppressive nature of that silence for the most vulnerable among us who need to know that their community stands with them. People have experienced hateful emails and public taunts, but feel they cannot speak. Then there is the honorable legacy of our town in standing up and speaking out for peace and justice, especially when our tax dollars make us complicit. 
Uh, there is the issue of how many of our tax dollars go to military funding with that much less available. You need to finish up right and now. To close. For more information, please email Amherst for ceasefire at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you. We're going back to the audience. Mickey White, please enter the room. State your name and where you live. I don't know if you can hear me, but um, my name is Mickey White. I'm a resident and a student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I'm here to reiterate what my peers in the room um, did about passing the Cherish Act and adding the Amendment of the Debt-Free Future Act in order to make higher education affordable for all. My perspective is a little bit different as I am graduating this spring. Um, I majored in legal studies and minored in political science. I've led social media strategies for my university's mock trial team, and I've even interned at the Women's Institute for Leadership Development over this past summer. I'm also a part of the communication board for the student-led activist group Phenom, who stand proudly with you in that room today. And I'm not splurging all of these things out to toot my own horn or soak into the endeavors of my undergraduate achievements. I'm saying it because it wouldn't have been possible without the financial assistance of scholarships and my amazing parents. I worked a total of three jobs this past year just to keep up with the financial hardships of my undergraduate education. And unfortunately, a lot of my peers don't have the same assistance I do, so it is hard for them to afford to keep going here. Um, passing the Cherish Act and adding the Debt-Free Future Act as an amendment would extremely help this um, for the reasons that my counterpart said earlier. I can't imagine some of the struggles that some of them face every single day. And council members, I believe that you have the opportunity to make this easier for everyone. So um, please just consider that. And yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us, Mickey. Jenny McKenna, oh, please. please. Thank you. No. Jenny McKenna. Hi. My name is Jenny McKenna. Um, I use she and her, and I live in District 5. I'm not sure the resolution will fit in the two minutes. I don't. I just will stop at the end. Is that or can I read the whole resolution? You can read whatever you would like as long as you finish in an at one minute and forty three minute seconds. Okay. Um, whereas on October sixteenth, twenty twenty three, the Amherst Town Council gave unanimous support to a resolution condemning the October seventh Hamas attack on Israel that took nearly twelve hundred lives. Whereas since October seventh, twenty twenty three. The Israel, Israeli government siege of Gaza has killed more than 27,000 Palestinians, most of them civilians, nearly half of them children, whereas more than 1.9 residents of Gaza have been forced to leave their homes, many of them displaced multiple times. I will now skip to the resolution and skip the other whereases. Be it resolved that we, the Amherst Town Council, call for an immediate and sustained ceasefire in Gaza an end to the Israeli military siege of the Gaza Strip, the release of the hostages and detainees on both sides, removal of obstacles to urgently needed humanitarian aid entering Gaza, and an end to unconditional U.S. military aid to the Israeli government. Be it further resolved that we extend our support to all the brokenhearted and vulnerable members of our Amherst community who are directly affected by this ongoing crisis, reaffirm our commitment to the safety of all members of our community and pledge to join with others seeking just and peaceful solutions. Be it further resolved that the clerk of the Amherst Town Council shall cause a copy of this resolution to be sent to President Joseph Biden, you have 15 President seconds. Kamala Harris, Senator Elizabeth Warren, Senator Edward Markey, and Representative Jim McGovern. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are going to back to the Zoom audience. Liam Rue, please enter the room and state your name and where you live. I am Liam Rue. I live on 502 Main Street in uh, downtown Amherst. Uh, good evening. Thank you for having me. 
I'm a junior at UMass Amherst and a member of the Public Higher Education Network of Massachusetts, advocating for more accessible, affordable higher education in Mass. College education is supposed to be one of the greatest strengths of Massachusetts. It's the most educated state in the nation, and that has in no small part contributed to its immense prosperity and economic dynamism. Amherst is a perfect example of Massachusetts excellence in higher education with three rigorous institutions of higher learning. But instead of maintaining a system that works for everyone, Massachusetts celebrated prosperity is increasingly out of reach for all but a wealthy minority. This is why I ask that you include in the resolution supporting the Cherish Act support for Natalie Higgins' Debt-Free Future Act, which would make all public colleges in Massachusetts tuition-free for in-state residents. For decades, tuition in our public universities has continued to rise to the point where even middle-class families struggle to afford it. Adjusted for inflation, UMass tuition has increased more than 50% where, while state funding has continued to decline over decades. To keep up, the median amount of debt incurred after four years has risen to over $30,000. Over half of all UMass students take out loans, a sign it is failing its main mission of providing affordable college. I've seen this personally as one student had to raise $8,000 just, just to continue studying at UMass Amherst one semester, while one of my close friends has to spend all money earned over every summer towards paying off student loans. The Cherish Act, if passed, would substantially boost public colleges like UMass, but including the Debt-Free Future Act would go even further towards providing truly affordable college. It would show that families should not have to pay exorbitant tuition just because they can. You have 15 seconds. Once again, I ask that you amend the resolution in the GOL committee supporting the Cherish Act to also support Natalie Higgins' Debt-Free Future Act, which would make all public colleges in Massachusetts tuition-free for in-state residents. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. Next, we have Jerry Weiss. Bring me out. My name is Gerald Weiss. I live in District 5. On October 7th, 2023, Hamas fighters brutally attacked Israel Israeli settlers, killing an estimated 1,200 people raping women and taking 250 hostages, 85 of whom have returned to their homes. It is also estimated that of those killed, 36 were children. It is still unknown how many women were raped. Also on October 7, 2023, the Israeli military began a bombardment, bombardment of Gaza that has destroyed or damaged 360,000 residential units, more than half of Gaza's homes. At least 27,000 people, including more than 11 and a half thousand children, and 8,000 women have been killed, more than 66,000 injured, including at least 8,600 children and 6,300 women. More than 8,000 people are listed as missing. 1.9 million people, over 80% of Gaza's populations, are once again refugees. None of Gaza's 36 hospitals are fully functional, and only 15 are open at all. There is widespread starvation, dehydration, and worsening malnutrition and severe physical suffering due to the bombing and lack of medical care. There is no food shortage or housing crisis or medical insufficiency in Israel as a result of the Hamas attack. There are no displaced people. Between now and when you go to bed tonight, another 60 to 80 Palestinians, 25 to 30 of them children, will be killed. This will not make Israel safer. It will not make Jews or Muslims around the world safer. An eye for an eye passed quickly by in mid-October. On October 16, 2023, the Amherst Town Council appropriately and unanimously passed a proclamation in support of Israel condemning the attack on Israel. It is time to proclaim your and thus our town's allegiance to humanity for all people. You have 15 seconds. It is time for you to proclaim your support for the innocent people of Gaza who have suffered and continue to suffer in unthinkable atrocities on a daily basis. It is time for the Israeli government to stop the annihilation of Gaza you and its people complete. largely made possible with U.S. supplied missiles and bombs. Thank you. Thank you. We're going back to the audience. Isabel Anderson, please enter the room. State your name and where you live. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Wonderful. Um, my name is Isabel Anderson. I 
go to Amherst College. Um, I hope that's sufficient for where I'm from. And I'm here as the co-chair of Amherst College Young Democratic Socialists to discuss the Debt-Free Future Act on behalf of the Amherst College community and in support of VNOM. I know that Amherst College and UMass at face value may seem very different. One is a private institution and one is a public university. But working with UMass Phenom and my own colleagues in our YDSA has shown that there is a solidarity between us and it lies in the exorbitant and inaccessible costs of higher education. At Amherst DSA, we have learned that accessibility only begins when we stand with public education. Although many of us benefit from the privilege of attending a private institution, just as many of us will be wrecked with student debt following our Amherst education. Personally, after benefiting from a quality public education in my home state of Virginia, that was the only way that I made it to a school like Amherst in the first place. Similarly, those of us in Amherst DSA who experienced publication, public education before coming here recognize the necessity to stand in solidarity with our phenom friends and the thousands of Massachusetts residents that deserve more from their public university. In the town of Amherst specifically, we know at Amherst College that we have historically underserved the town we're located in. We stand in support of the Debt for Future Act as an opportunity to begin to bridge this gap for the many students and employees of UMass who deserve a brighter debt-free future. Supporting the Debt-Free Future Act provides an opportunity to begin to repair the divide between our campus and the Amherst community as a whole through the statewide enforceable equity initiative. To amend the higher education resolution to support the Debt-Free Future Act is to support the Amherst community, colleges and towns alike. You have That's 15 all. Thank seconds. You. I conclude my comment. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Mark Barrett. Good evening. We need to use the ARPA funds for all the departments at the Bank Community Center. Good evening. My name is Mark Barrett. I'm a member of the Council on Aging, Friends of the Senior Center, a Senior Center volunteer, and also the founder and facilitator of the Rainbow Coffee Hour, a LGBTQIA plus and allies group. We meet for coffee and conversation once a month, <clears throat> excuse me, at the Senior Center, which helps to solve the issue of loneliness and social isolation, which is linked to uh, serious health conditions such as the risk of dementia, according to the CDC. This is just one of the programs offered at the Senior Center. I invite all of you to come and have a cup of coffee. The Senior Center is located in the Bangs Community Center. It is only one of the five departments located in the Bangs Center. They all help and service the members of our community. However, the Bangs Community Center building is outdated and not up to code. Some of the major deficiencies are no working kitchen, no security cameras, lack of ventilation in an exercise room that's full of equipment, but we cannot use it. The ARPA funds should be used to fix the bank center for all the departments, not just the senior center. This is a win-win for everyone in the community. I appreciate your attention to this matter and please stop into the Rainbow Coffee Hour tomorrow and have a cup of coffee and speak with your fellow community members. We would love to meet you. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us, Mark. Thank you. We're going back to the Zoom audience. Chrisania Dangor. I apologize for mispronouncing your name. As you enter the room, please state your name and where you live. Okay. Hello. Um, I'm Chrisania Dangor, um, and I'm a student at UMass. Um, and I would like to ask you to um, pass the resolution in regards to higher ed for all and amend it to include the debt-free future. It's a huge struggle for so many of my peers here at UMass Amherst. Um, so I was glad to hear about this resolution um, because it involves a lot of important support um, for public higher education, but this alone is not enough to ensure that all students can reasonably afford college. Um, students' financial situation can change need to work during college creates a lot of stress and makes it harder to succeed um, in college. So we need to do more to end the student, dress, the student debt crisis. College is a necessity um, and should be available to everyone. 
Um, so we need free public college for everyone. Um, and that's why I'm asking you to amend the resolution to include the Debt Free Future Act. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. Athena. Ian Rodewald. Good evening. My name is Ian Rodewald. I live in District 1 on Pine Street. I'll try to go through this quickly as I've made three minutes worth. I work as the field organizer for the Western Mass Area Labor Federation, a coalition of more than 60 public and private sector unions uh, in Hampshire, Hampton, Franklin, and Berkshire counties. Nine of our unions are based here at UMass Amherst. Uh, passing the CHERISH Act is one of the or, uh, one of organized labor's top priorities this year. The aspect of the CHERISH Act that I want to address specifically is that the CHERISH Act would create a path for students to graduate from college debt-free starting in uh, fiscal year 24 with debt-free community college and in subsequent years for four-year universities. The graduating class of 2023 from Massachusetts public higher ed institutions alone had a collective debt of roughly $400 million with UMass Amherst graduates uh, having about $36,000 in student debt on average. In addition to skyrocketing tuition, the often undiscussed campus Campus capital debt is a major reason for the financial burden placed upon students. As student investment, as state investment in public colleges and universities fell over the past decades, cash-strapped universities took on capital debt in order to build new buildings or do deferred maintenance on old buildings. Campuses then became indebted to debt servicers and foisted the, the, the cost onto students. At UMass, for example, students have to pay more than $4,000 a year in fees that go directly toward paying off campus debt. Uh, so I urge you to pass this resolution. Um, also, you've heard uh, many comments about uh, amending the resolution to include um, debt free future. Uh, as a uh, community sponsor, I would urge you to listen to the, the comments and uh, think about them for a, a further resolution down the road, which I'd be happy to work with counselors on. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Eleanor Everett, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. All right, do you hear me? We can. Great, I'm Eleanor Everett. I go to UMass Amherst. I live at 112 Eastman Lane. I'd like to see the Amherst Town Council amends the current resolution regarding higher ed to all to also include support for the Debt-Free Future Act. Affording college is a challenge for possibly everyone I know. If it's not someone directly, my own age it's their children or their friends and yeah I, I i agree with what the others have said thank you for joining us max page good evening Max Page, I live at 84 McClellan Street in Amherst. Thanks for taking the time to hear us. Um, I am a professor at UMass Amherst, but right now I'm also president of the Massachusetts Teachers Association, which represents 117,000 public school and college educators, and the CHERISH Act is one of our top priorities. And I'll simply say what I think many understand, but it's worth just repeating, that there's no way we achieve as a town or a commonwealth our racial or economic justice goals without access to both truly debt-free and high-quality public higher education. And the CHERISH Act is a blueprint that's been developed in, uh, by, with a wide number of people and includes um, 107 co-sponsors. Of course, it's led by Senator Comerford from our area, of course, supported by Rep. Dom as well. And it answers both those questions. It makes a guarantee on the one hand that, that students can access and will graduate debt-free from public higher education. That's on one side of the equation, but the, on the quality side of the education of the equation, it makes clear that we have to have the student supports that students need to succeed. It makes sure that, that faculty and staff have pay and benefits um, that they deserve to have a high quality institution um, like, like UMass Amherst. And it insists that we have to have buildings that are paid for by the state not by student fees that only exacerbate the, the student debt problem. So really the CHERISH Act is a blueprint for how we achieve this crucial, crucial benefit, not only for individuals, it's for the Commonwealth. Obviously many others have said how 
education is the cornerstone of the prosperity, prosperity of the Commonwealth, but we have sorely underfunded public higher education. So I urge you to support the higher ed for all um, resolution, and hopefully we can pass the Cherish Act this year, as it has a lot of support and a lot of momentum behind it, including funding from the Fair Share Amendment, and we are glad that that passed a year and a half ago and provides the funding. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Ashwin uh, Ravakumar, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. And my apologies if I've mispronounced your name. Sure. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Ashwin Ravi Kumar, and I'm an Amherst resident in District 2. Uh, so I'm speaking in support of the ceasefire resolution that Josna introduced so eloquently earlier um, and that Jen followed up on, and also in support of the Debt-Free Future Act as part of our resolution, issues that I think are really intimately connected, and I'd like to just underscore why. So the ongoing violence in Gaza affects us all in so many ways. Our taxes are funding ethnic cleansing, and yet we do not have much influence over federal government policy, at least not directly. Local governments serve as an official, as, an, as, a, way, as a voice of the popular morality that we all hold and have the platform um, to advance our values to a much higher level. <clears throat> our neighbors and community members who have family members in Gaza who are Arab and Muslim are feeling acutely the ambivalence and even tacit support for the ongoing violence in some quarters as a threat to their safety in our community. So to the extent that we honor our commitments to inclusiveness and to anti-racism, our counselors have an obligation and an opportunity to stand with those community members. And of course, seeing as how services like education, rights like education are not easily provided for, this cuts to the core of how we need to be spending our resources and what we need to be advocating for, for the kind of society we want to live in. This has a historical tradition. In 1984, the Oakland City Council passed a resolution formally condemning apartheid in South Africa. This would be the first in a torrent of formal municipal statements on this seemingly faraway matter, grounded in the intense feelings of empathy and solidarity of regular people. So please, I urge you all to pass the ceasefire resolution, um, to stand with our neighbors of all backgrounds, to act in accordance with our basic sense that we have shared humanity for all, wrap all up. people, and as such, refuse to stand by in the face of ethnic cleansing and genocide. Let's fund education, let's pass the Debt-Free Future Act, and let's pass this ceasefire resolution. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Athena? I'm going to apologize in advance if I have trouble reading some of these names. Stephanie Marcotte, I think. All right. Hello there. Uh, my name is Dr. Stephanie Marcotte. I'm a resident and a renter in Precinct 3B in Amherst with my husband and my two-year-old daughter. Um, I urge you to pass the Higher Ed for All resolution, um, which mentions by name the Cherish Act. Um, my husband is a graduate of UMass Amherst. I'm a graduate of Hampshire College, and we have been lucky enough to continue to live in Amherst. Um, collectively, my husband and I carry over $227,000 in student loan debt, which is a hefty amount of money. Um, if we were able to pass the Cherish Act and therefore um, meet the vision of higher ed for all, uh, we would be able to, instead of paying, you know, what would be $1,000 a month to pay off our student loans in 20 years, that's money that we could be spending um, to continue to live in Amherst, to own a home, to pay taxes for our daughter to go to Amherst debt-free. Um, but instead, unfortunately, we have had to take out exorbitant amount of student loan debt um, to fund our education. If we pass the Cherish Act, other people would not have to be in my position. They'd be able to use that thousand dollars and instead invest in their own business, make sure that they're able to fund for their daughter to go to college debt free, um, and also be able to plan so that they have a future of retirement and they're able to continue to live in Amherst for the foreseeable future. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. Ella Prabhakar. Um, good evening, counselors. Thank you for hearing us tonight. My name is Ella Prabhakar. I'm a student at UMass Amherst, an organizer with Vietnam, and also a student. 
just turn that off, sorry. Um, I am here once again to advocate for a motion to be put forward to amend the resolution in regards to higher ed for all to include the Debt-Free Future Act. Um, you've heard many incredible voices today voicing support for the Cherish Act, and I absolutely urge you to support this resolution overall. However, I think there is an important amendment that needs to be made if we are going to truly realize the vision of higher ed for all, which is the addition of Natalie Higgins' Debt-Free Future Act. Um, myself and my peers are obviously struggling with student debt. You've heard my story a couple of weeks ago. You've heard the stories of others. Um, and I'm just here to reiterate this ask. Um, and I hope that in my position as student senator, as an organizer on many different causes through the rest of my career at UMass Amherst, um, I hope to help facilitate the relationship between students and the town as a whole. And I think this could be a really productive way to begin that conversation or continue that conversation, depending on your perspective. Thank you Thank for you. joining us. Nicholas, um, I'm sorry, Rev Benedictus. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. My name is Nicholas D. Benedictus and I'm a sophomore and resident at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Thank you, honored members of the town council and others. I deeply appreciate the opportunity that I'm being offered today. I sit before you in support of the Debt-Free Future Act. Despite my best efforts, I find myself unable to console my friends when they talk about their struggles paying for college. I feel vitriol, I feel grief, but most of all, I feel hopeless. What can I tell them? That it will be okay, it will be anything but. One of my closest friends, Josh, never attended college because he could not afford it. My friend Tara worries about her tuition bill, having already taken out all the loans she's allowed. Now struggling to find gainful employment to afford college, what can I tell her? What do I tell Ivy, who has also never finished college, the expense of which she finds completely insurmountable? Amherst already expressed its support for the Cherish Act, which I'm in full support of. Yet without the Debt-Free Future Act, the problems within American universities will remain. All students, rich or poor, should be allowed to attend college. And many middle-class families do not have the savings or income to afford such a massive expense, yet they hardly qualify for much, if any, financial aid. This is about priorities and values. Do we value our students and our education enough to offer it to everyone? To keep this country healthy and our democracy strong, we need people to be educated well. So I say it must be free. I implore you to amend the resolution in regards to higher ed for Please all. Please complete your comments. Support for the Debt-Free Future Act. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Henry Morgan. Good evening, councillors. I'm Henry Morgan, and I'm here to reiterate what I said to you in the previous council meeting and in the GOL committee, asking you to include an amendment to the resolution in support of higher education for all, to include support for Natalie Higgins and James B. Eldridge's bill, the Debt-Free Future Act. The reason why you need to support this is because the student community needs this. The reality of student debt is destructive. It destroys the lives of millions of people in America. And I'm asking each of you to come in support of this bill. Our labor representatives, when they advocate for the Cherish Act, need to include support for students. And you do too. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Leo Wedeman. Good evening. Hello, my name is Leo Wedeman. I am a first year student at Hampshire College. Um, I'm here to urge you to amend the resolution in regards to higher ed for all to include the Debt Free Future Act. I also implore you to listen to the incredible voices that have spoken before me. Education is a human right and the only road to true equality. I believe we must do everything we can to make it accessible. That is it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hiro Sarna. Uh, 
Uh, good evening, counselors. My name is Cairo Serna. I am a resident of Amherst. Uh, I represent, I'm one of the people responsible for representing college students to the Massachusetts Democratic Party, and I serve on the Massachusetts Commission of LGBTQ Youth, which includes college age youth. I'm here today to ask you, uh, once again, to file an amendment uh, to the upcoming resolution supporting the Cherish Act to include support for a debt-free future. We, students of Amherst, make up about half of your town's population, and many of us voted you into office. However, we are still a hugely underrepresented group in local government and government at all levels. The Amherst Town Council can and should advocate to fill this gap of representation. Uh, as I mentioned uh, the last time I testified here, the housing crisis is in large part due to predatory housing practices by UMass, uh, supplemented by practices by local landlords. Both of these are incentivized by students' desperation for cheaper housing in order to offset the exorbitant costs of higher ed. And alleviating the financial burden of higher ed on students will also relieve pressure on local housing for all residents in Amherst. As I'm sure we all know, it's not just students who suffer from the housing crisis in Amherst and all of these impacts need to be relieved, not for students, but also for permanent residents. Debt-free future and cherish are two sides of the same coin that you as Amherst Town Council can advocate for in order to represent and protect your constituents. They're recognized by Senator Joe Comerford and others as Massachusetts' best opportunity to replace affirmative action because disparities in financial access always reflect other social inequalities. Please complete your remarks. I ask you today to advocate for the futures of thousands of students in Amherst who rely on your representation and who desperately need financial aid for college. Thank you. Thank you. Liam, is it Lane or Love? Okay, come on up, thank you. All right, does this work? I won't take up too much of your time. So hello, I'm Liam Love. I'm the chair of the Hampshire College uh, Young Democratic Socialists of America. And I'm calling on you to support um, the resolution for the Debt-Free Future Act. Um, it's not only the correct moral choice to eliminate student debt, but it's also the sensible economic choice. Um, students today are struggling to get through college, not primarily due to grades or tests, um, but it's to keep paying hundreds or even thousands of dollars a semester um, every, you know, every single semester, right? <laughs> um, I know multiple students who have had to drop out due to these economic shackles that are holding them from achieving higher education. Uh, this will affect me as well for my third and fourth year. Um, so I'm not looking forward to that, but I'll get my stuff sorted before then. Um, so I'm asking you again, please amend the resolution in higher ed for all and include the Debt-Free Future Act to show the students of this historic college town that you have our backs. Thank you. Thank you. Nick Kawasaki. Uh, hello, Nick Kawasaki. I'm a student at Hampshire College. Please amend the resolution with regards to higher ed for all to include support for the Debt-Free Future Act. Student debt is an insidious and destructive weight on the futures of the American working public. Its influence is not merely limited to the financial futures of those who have already been through higher education. It also acts as a barrier to those who may wish to pursue higher education, but either cannot or do not wish to take on the amount of debt it would require. In today's economic climate, the amount of debt the student is saddled with is, for vast swaths of the population, entirely untenable. It would be an unbelievable weight off the shoulders of those who have been through or are currently in higher education, as well as a practical lifting of a blockade on the axis of disadvantaged and working class students to higher education. Higher education is an important step towards self and community emancipation from poverty, as well as a vital sector of training in the types of knowledge and jobs which are needed to make both the local and national economy strong. Ending student debt is an investment in the future, in the working people, and in the country. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Phyllis Keenan. Hello, I'm Phyllis Keenan. I live at 10 Stanley Street in um, Precinct 2 in Amherst. Um, I'm here to speak to you in support of the resolution for higher ed for all by passage of the Cherish Act. We've all heard about the student debt, so I won't talk about that. I'd like to talk about the faculty and staff who are greatly underpaid 
particularly at the community colleges. When we looked at what um, people were paid in California, who ha which has a comparable cost of living as Massachusetts, we're paid about half of what they're paid. So clearly, um, we need a big increase in pay in order to afford to live here. I'm somebody who has, I own a house in Amherst, thanks to Habitat for Humanity, because I worked on building that house 20 hours a week for a year, and then I took on the debt. Um, I have a mortgage, I have excellent credit, but nobody would give me a loan because I didn't make enough money. I could pay a rent, which is more than what my mortgage is, but I could not get a mortgage. And that has to do with what my wages are. I'm a math professor, I'm an adjunct professor. And as adjunct faculty in this state, more than 60% of us make less than 20,000 a year. More than 90% of us make less than 40,000 a year. That is way less than the average income. And it is very hard to live in this state on that income. And one of the things that we're looking for also is more student services to be um, performed by people who are faculty and staff who are paid a living wage. I ask you to support the resolution in support of higher ed for all by passage of the CHERISH Act. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Aiden, I'm sorry, I can't make out your last name. Aiden, please come up. Um, my name is Aiden Rycheski. Um, I live in Amherst, Hampshire College, and I come with a request for the town of Amherst to file and pass Natalie Higgins and Jamie Eldridge's uh, debt-free act to improve access to higher education. Thank you. <laughs> Mav McCabe, please come up. Hello to the council people in Amherst. I come with a request for the town of Amherst to file and pass the Cherish Act's debt-free future amendment to improve access to higher education for my fellow five college students at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. Grace Davis. Hi, um, good evening council members. My name is Grace Davis and I'm a student and resident of UMass Amherst. Um, I urge the board to pass the resolution to support the CHERISH Act with an amendment to include Natalie Higgins Debt Free Future Act, which will make all public colleges in Massachusetts tuition free. According to a study by Georgetown University, 72% of jobs will require a college degree by the year 2031. The rise of AI and automation combined with increasing use of technology and employment means that many of the jobs for those without college degrees will shrink and even become obsolete. This does not need to be a fact that we should mourn as long as we adopt our policies to reflect this changing economic environment. Additionally, making public college free would help drive down the exorbitant costs of private institutions and help make higher education more accessible for all. As many have stated, Amherst is a town with three prominent universities within its borders and many more in greater Western Mass. We urge you to pass the resolution to support the CHERISH Act and a minute to include the Debt-Free Future Act to help make quality education a right and not a privilege. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. That's the last name on the register. Thank you. And we want to thank all of you that have come forward this evening and stuck with the minutes that we restricted you to. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, we're going to move on to the consent agenda. Uh, and let me just say that um, I'm going to read the motion sheet. And if you plan to vote no on one of the consent agenda items, because there is or you plan to vote no on the consent agenda because there is one item you do not agree with, you should ask that that item be removed once I make the original motion. Okay. Um,
I move to the I move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. Eight C referral of Community Preservation Act committee funding recommendations to the Finance Committee. Please note we will discuss this later, so that you'll still have an opportunity to discuss it. This is just to vote the referral. Um, 8E, approval of March 5, 2024, presidential primary election warrant. 11A, adoption of January 22, 2024, town council meeting minutes. Are there any people that would like something removed? Seeing no hands, uh, before we move to a vote, I just want to disclose I that- second, second the motion. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, thank you for seconding. Um, I want to disclose that I have filed a um, conflict of a potential conflict of interest, which I do not have, in regard to the Community Preservation Act, because my husband Brian Harvey is one of the filers with one of the uh, particular um, items that has been requested for funding. Um, with that, is there? We've had a motion on the floor and a second. We're going to move to a vote. Uh, I'm going to start with Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Uh, Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Joe. Han Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord is absent. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. It's unanimous with, I'm sorry, I didn't go back to the beginning. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Oh, now it's unanimous with one councillor absent. Okay, we are going to move to the resolution, uh, which is the resolution in support of higher ed for all. And um, I understand that there are some potential additions to this. So we're going to place the resolution um, we're going to move to adopt the resolution in support of higher ed for all. And uh, I need a second, and then we'll move on to potential discussion and amendments. Second, Dublin Gothier. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm going to first ask Pat DeAngelis, as I'm sorry, it's not Pat DeAngelis. That's How dare you? One. I'm going to first ask Anna Devlin Gothier, who is chair of Governance Organization and Legislation Committee for her report. Thank you. So GOL discussed the resolution that you have in your packet uh, on our first meeting, which was very a, a thrilling meeting. Um, and you know, I think there were a couple of things we did ultimately determine it to be clear, consistent, and actionable, uh, which is what we were looking at. There was a question of whether or not the sponsors would be bringing forward a uh, a proposed amendment. Um, at that point, they did not bring forward an, an amendment uh, at the GOL meeting and. The discussion landed um, on that they would consider bringing forward a separate resolution. It, that's up to the prerogative of the sponsors. Our job was to determine whether this resolution was clear, consistent, and actionable, which we did. Okay. Questions and comments? Hand up, Pat. Thank you, Pat DeAngelis. Uh, thank you, and I want to thank GOL, but I think we rushed through, uh, and there was actually a lack of clarity in this resolution, and um, that was brought to our attention, and the sponsors uh, and I met together, and we, are, we have a proposal to add two new whereas clauses, which we think will address the issue of clarity and what this resolution is about. And um, I understand you've given those to the clerk of the council in advance, so we can show them on the screen. Please. Thank you. The amendments would include a new first whereas, whereas the Cherish Act establishes a blueprint for a world-class system of public higher education that is urgently needed to meet widely shared goals in the Commonwealth. 
and Second Amendment, whereas, if passed, the Cherished Act would enable people of all backgrounds in every community to build successful and fulfilling lives, address economic, social, and racial equity gaps, meet our state's climate change goals, create high quality workplaces with fair wages and benefits to attract and retain faculty and staff, enable new discoveries and innovation, and invest in a competitive workforce that is the engine of the state's economy. I have uh, two minor, uh, in the, we need to go higher. Yeah. Okay, and which you uh, pardon me, you're you're adding a whereas, is that right? Oh, is it this? No, keep going with these additional corrections. universities yeah thank you if you could do that that'd be grand um we're asking that uh in the third line where it says uh affirmative action which threatens to undermine access to students of color and given that there we would like to add given that there after the end and that would be the only uh, one there i think Councillor Ryan has something he wants to add. But in the last, we are we have removed um, the whereas that says the Cherish Act, yeah, that one, commits the resources to ensure a strong and healthy public higher ed. We have taken that out and ha are asking to replace it with, now therefore be it resolved that the Town Council of Amherst calls upon state leaders and the legislature to pass bills S816 and H1260, an act committing to higher education, the resources to ensure a strong and healthy public higher education system. And there should be a comma right there, the Cherish Act uh, to improve higher education in Massachusetts, Massachusetts, sorry. And then this one where it says and cause, I believe it should say, be it further resolved that the clerk of the council, town council shall cause a copy of this resolution to be sent to um, uh, Governor Healy, Lieutenant Governor Driscoll, et cetera, Senator Comerford and Representative Mindy, Mindy Dom. Um, and those are the amendments that the sponsors and I have. Okay. Uh, George, you also had something. I just, I just assume we get them all in here. There is one other thing I'd like to bring up. Okay. It's in paragraph five. Um, five, did you say? Five, please. Yes. Um, I'd like to move to uh, remove the word destructive from that second clause. Okay. Um, as a sponsor, uh, there's two sponsors here, uh, Councillor Walker and Pat DeAngelis. Uh, is that a problem? Well, Lynn, actually, I'd like to speak to that okay, so people understand do. why I'm doing it. It's not yeah. just random uh, wordsmithing. Point I, of order. Sorry. Yeah. I'm just confused. Is this part of the motion that no. Councillor? There's a motion on the floor. And so if there's amendments, there has to be motions to amend. So I'm confused as what's going okay. on right now. Thank you. Uh, let's, okay, you would like to have a motion to amend? Yes. The motion that's on the floor. Yes. Thank you. And it's to remove the word destructive. Yes. Is there a second to the motion to amend? We made amendments. You did. So would you want me to just go with that amendment or? This is how sausage is made. Okay. Council Ryan, please. We're just gonna take your motion off the floor for the moment. Leave the word destructive in. Are there any other comments with regard to the amendment that has been made? And was there a was second? there a sec? Yes, there needs to be a second. I'll second Pat's amendment. Thank you. Further discussion, Pat uh, or Alicia. 
I don't really have anything else to add right now. Okay. I don't have anything else to add, but I just wanted also some clarity. So if we have this motion to amend on the floor now and George wanted to amend something else, how would that work? We would pass these amendments and then have a new yes. motion on the floor to amend again. Yes, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there any other comment? Are there any other comments from counselors? I can't see hands. Can we just see the clauses again? The yes, first please thing? go to thank the you. top. Devlin Gothier, Ryan Rooney, and Steinberg all have their hands up. Thank you. I can't see any hands at this point. Um, let's start with the first hand that's up. That's me. I have a separate grammatical amendment that I can. Okay. We're going to wait on that. Uh, next is Pam. Pam, Pam Rooney. Pam Rooney. So, um, so we're getting, we're getting some, uh, amendment to this resolution. Um, we have heard from the audience a number of people mentioning that we should amend the Cherish Act with Debt Free Future Act. Um, I have not seen the wording and text for that, so there's no way I can support something that I've not actually read yet. But, but um, I would I would actually lean towards sending this back to GOL to complete the work listen to what these folks are saying, see if there's any merit in in adding the Debt-Free Future Act to all of the other changes that are being um, manipulated tonight in in this manner. I think it's it's very difficult. I would much rather see this come to us as a proposal and a finished proposal rather than wordsmithing on the floor. I'm going to call on uh, the chair of GOL, uh, Anna Devlin Gothier. So the sponsors did not opt to make that amendment at GOL. GOL will not edit a resolution to add amendments to it. We're doing clarity, consistency, and actionability. If the sponsors wanted to to submit an amended resolution, they could have done that, and they opted not to. So that's, yeah, they opted not to at that point. If they choose to in the future, that's up to them. But at that meeting, they had opted not to continue with the resolution as submitted. Okay. Um, uh, Andy. So I um, try and be quick, but cover two topics. One, in, a, in, in saying this, I want to make it clear that I'm going to sound like I have uh, serious reservations about both the Cherish Act and the Debt Free Futures Act. I don't, uh, but I do have concerns about where we are as a council and process and how we're going about considering things. And it's two parts. One is that referring it to a committee that has a limited role of looking at clarity, consistency, and actionability, you, we don't have the opportunity then to have it go to a committee that is looking about the substantive value of the um, proposal or concerns about the proposal that ought to be considered. And um, I, I, it, it does have a consequence because we would be stating a legislative priority um, in the adoption of such a resolution so that not having the complete discussion I think becomes problematic. Um, the thing that I wanted to point out that I don't think that there's been any discussion about is that there's several people who correctly pointed out that um, there was a fair share amendment that was passed that provided substantial additional funding for education and for transportation. Um, and this is... Uh, clearly a statement of an important need for the use of education funding. But it's not the only use for education or transportation funding, as we know for the town how dependent we are 
on support for both. Um, and even in the education field, our own public schools are uh, our K to 12 schools, both the um, elementary schools and the region that provides middle and high school are under tremendous financial stress. And part of that financial stress is due to the fact that um, as a result of the Student Opportunity Act, that um, there's a, uh, we are um, being given very small increases for an extended number of years um, in Chapter 70 funding, which is the state funding at the tune of $30 per student, which is the number that was in the Student Opportunity Act. The Massachusetts Municipal Association has asked that that be increased to $100, but also supports full funding for the Student Opportunity Act. For all of those reasons, um, if we um, look out for advocacy, <coughs> excuse me, advocacy for our K-12 schools, uh, we are also calling on a big ask for education funding. And I don't think that uh, in our process that we've had a committee that has looked at the bundle of issues that are underlying all of this tension that comes about because ultimately uh, all resources are limited, including the fair share amendment resources. Okay. Um, Pat, uh, I'm sorry, Anna, you still have your hand up. Okay, Pat, you have your hand up. Yeah, let me see. Uh, one of the things I want to clarify is that the sponsors, Alicia, uh, Councillor Walkler, and myself, uh, we are not including um, the resolution uh, for free college for all our debt free future act. Thank you. Um, that is not our goal. Our goal is to look at the Cherish Act and to support it. We, uh, I feel strongly, I can't speak for Councillor Walker on this, I feel strongly that the Debt-Free Future Act, if it's going to be a resolution, needs to come to GOL. Uh, and as Andy's saying, it may need to go to other committees. But if we look at the Cherish Act, um, I feel like it supports very important initiatives. Uh, and I think that we need to sort of uh, separate out what's happening in terms of what, you know, how we are going to pay for education in Massachusetts, how we're going to do this. I don't see the point, and I'm not being very clear right now, and I apologize. I do not see the point of this going to the Finance Committee or the Community Resources Committee, or the Town Services Committee uh, to, dis to analyze the Cherish Act. Um, I think that its amendment to, public ed to Chapter 15 of the general uh, laws in Massachusetts, it, its amendments to what is already there, uh, and there are important amendments to make college accessible. As somebody who wasn't able to go to college until I was in my 40s and didn't graduate with a BA till I was 50, um, I understand how important a college education can be. I understand the dilemma of some of the students in this room, not all, because they're not all facing the same dilemma. But, uh, you know, we need to move forward with the CHERISH Act. And the um, and that's all I can say right okay. now, because I'm not being very articulate. That's Thank you. Else. So the... the there's an amendment on the floor. The amendment's been made. It's been seconded. It's the one that is in the on the screen. Uh, so we're only speaking to that amendment at this time. George, I'm sorry, Councillor Walker, you have your hand up. Uh, thank you, Lynn. I just wanted to sort of piggyback on Pat's statement, but also respond to Pam's question um, in terms of the process where we went with as the sponsors. Um, and so I personally am completely in support of the Debt Free Future Act um, as a UMass alum who still is very absorbed by my student loan debt in a way that it prevents me from even buying a house in this town. Um, I completely understand the importance of that act, but I signed out as a sponsor to the uh, resolution to support the Cherish Act before I was reached out to um, by other students. And um, 
just in terms of process, the other sponsors also have to be in board on board to make that kind of amendment. And we did speak about this. And what we talked about is trying to reach a certain timeline. Like we want to get this resolution, at least this portion of it, um, to the floor as soon as possible. Um, and so we don't want to send it back to GOL. And like Anna said, there's not much else they can review it for um, than what it was already been reviewed for. But we did get a comment at the GOL meeting from Councillor Ryan that was that, you know, someone who was reading this resolution before, it doesn't actually specify what the Cherish Act is. And so that's why we decided to add these two whereas is so that it's a little bit more clear to someone reading this resolution who does not already have prior knowledge of the Cherish Act, um, why we're saying these things and why we're trying to pass this. Um, with that being said, I personally do support the amendments that were suggested by a lot of our public comment tonight, but that may have to come to us in a separate resolution just because of the different constraints that might come along with it. George, uh, Councillor Ryan. So this resonates a great deal with me uh, I spent uh, 20 years teaching at HCC, and I can tell you all kinds of stories what it's like being an adjunct faculty member. So this is a plea for help, and I think it's something that we can amplify by voting for this. So I hope that you all will vote for it, and I do support it. Um, so I hear Andy's point that there are limited resources. Uh, that's true uh, in just about every endeavor, um, but that's not our problem. That's not our challenge. Uh, our challenge, I think, here is to, to pass this plea on uh, with our emphasis that this is important and it needs to be addressed. Uh, the final decision will be made somewhere else, and they will have to weigh all the other demands, and uh, that's not our problem. Our problem is a problem that we've heard eloquently tonight and in other meetings, and I hope that we will uh, amplify it by supporting this, this measure. Okay, the motion's been made and seconded. Uh, Councillor Ette. Please, go ahead. So if I'm understanding this correctly, a vote for the resolution is a vote for the Cherish Act as it is. Right that now, means. the question before the council is the amendment on the floor. And the amendment is shown on the screen in blue and later on with some strikeout and a few other small places that people have amended, like right there. Um, once we vote the amendment, then we go back to the original uh, motion, which is the motion for the whole resolution. Thank you. Okay. okay. Are there any other questions? Then we're gonna move to the vote on the amendment. I'm gonna start with Councillor Ette. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord is absent. Um, Counts uh, Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. It's unanimous. And so now we move back to the original motion and I see a hand up. George Ryan. Yeah, I would like to make a motion to amend in paragraph five and strike the word destructive. Um, Is there a second to that motion? Second. George, please speak to your motion. I hope the sponsors will see this as a friendly amendment. Perhaps they won't. Um, but um, in reading this, I felt that as it reads, given that the United States Supreme Court's decision on affirmative action threatens to undermine access to students of color, I think that's a, a true statement. I think destructive is a loaded word. I think it would have, uh, we just don't know what the impacts are going to be yet. At least I don't know what they're going to be. Some commentators feel that, in fact, the impacts will not be negative, but we just don't know. If there are, in fact, negative impacts as a result of the Supreme Court's decision, it probably should be cited somewhere in this document. So I just suggest that as a friendly amendment, my suggestion is to take out the loaded word and just leave the statement as a as bald and, and correct statement that it does threaten to undermine access. So that's my argument. Okay, the motion. I'm striking the word. Thank you. The motion's been made and seconded. Are there any other comments before we move to a vote? Okay, we're going to vote on. There's a hand up. I'm sorry, Anna. 
I'm I'm mulling and raising hands and I don't know, I'm going to, I'm going to half, half form my thought here. So we don't know that the results of that decision have been destructive, but the decision itself was destructive to the foundation of affirmative action. It wasn't so, so I agree with you. We don't know the results of it yet. It's too soon, but that Supreme court decision essentially destroyed the foundation of affirmative action. And I think, yeah, that's a slight editorial on it in my own framing. However, I do think that the the fact of how affirmative action was changed was that, I mean, you could find, you could say dismantled if that would feel better, but if, if destroyed has a negative connotation, but that decision did destroy what affirmative action is in terms of how it functions in higher education. Are there any other comments before we move to think, a vote? I think George has a comment back. George. I think it's a stronger statement with the word taken out. I think it's more effective. It'll be more effective in Boston. That's just my thought. Okay. The motion's been made in second. The motion is to remove the word destructive in the paragraph as shown on the screen. I'm going to move to a vote. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. The Councillor Lord is absent. Pam Rooney. Yes. Did you say no? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. No. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. No. Anna Devlin Gothier. No. Councillor Ette. Aye. Motion passes. There are eight people in favor, four opposed, and did I get that? One absent. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I I think it was nine, three. That's nine in favor. Nine in favor three and opposed three opposed and one absent. Thank you. Um, we're going to move now to the original motion unless somebody else has their hand up. Councilor Haneke. Thank you. Um, I want to echo what uh, Andy Steinberg said earlier about his concerns, because I have the same concerns about particularly the paragraph about new revenue from the fair share amendment, because given the numbers and amount of money we're talking about, use of the revenue from the fair share amendment for the Cherish Act or the Debt Free Future Act um, would basically eliminate the ability to use that revenue for K-12 public education. And we know in our own town how much K-12 public education absolutely needs um, revenue, particularly from the Fair Share Amendment, uh, as we, I believe, had some arguments to our own um, legislators last year when the initial Healy administration use of fair share amendment money came out without almost with almost no money to k-12 education mm -hmm. um the cherish act does have the language quote there shall be a debt-free college scholarship program that creates a path for debt-free college completion for all students which shall, shall include reasonable contributions from student and families so um to to respond to pat DeAngelis, um there is a notion of debt-free public education in the Cherish Act um, that that I, it sounded like you were implying with the Debt-Free Future Act that those were completely different in terms of where they were going. So I just wanted to clarify that that's what I saw in the Cherish Act. Um, when I read the Cherish Act, there's a lot of money that's needed for it. Um, and I, I have grave concerns that taking a position on that would harm our ability to argue for more money for K-12 education through the fair share amendment um, because they might conflict with each other due to the amount of money that appears to be needed if the Cherish Act passes. Okay. But you're not making a motion at this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, Anna? I have a, a, it's gonna sound very small after the edits that have been made. So. The Cherish Act is in here 
all capitalized with the and act capitalized. And do I need to make an official motion to have it be capital T, lowercase H E, cherish all caps, and then capital A, lowercase C T. It's just hurting my brain. Where where are we? Uh throughout the throughout the entire resolution. No problem. It's it was just break it was like breaking my head. Um okay, thank you. I wasn't sure. Do I need a formal amendment for that? Okay, thanks. It seemed small enough. So I, I do I wanna look back at what George um, said earlier, which is about how we communicate our values and communicate where we stand through resolutions and proclamations. And um, I've really, I've wrestled with this a lot because I think Amherst was, I believe the top um, per percentage of voters for the fair share amendment, right? Yeah, that's what I thought, yeah. And then we were in the bottom when it came to actual dollars doled out. And that stung for those of us and I'm, did not do nearly as much work advocating for the fair share as some of the folks in this room. Um, but for those of us who did push and fight for that act, it really hurt to get that uh, dollar amount back. It is tough to reconcile the uh, the two values that I think many of us hold at the same time, which is that we believe in debt-free college and we believe that our teachers need more funding. We believe that our schools need more funding. Uh, we see that this year even more than ever. And so I think for me, I, I do plan to support this resolution because I agree with what George said, that it communicates where we stand and that it's not necessarily our decision to do that exact math. Um, however, I do think that we need to continue our advocacy for our K-12 public schools. We can't let that drop. And um, I do think at some point we need to be communicating the message that when we're creating new streams of revenue, consideration must be given to existing programs that are really struggling, um, not just creating new, admittedly amazing uh, programs to use that funding. So I'm holding both of those right now and it's challenging, which is why I'm more supportive of the Cherish Act than the, the Debt for Futures Act, which we're not even discussing right now. So I'll let that go. But that's where I'm, that's where I'm at. Slightly so, rambly. There have been, a, this is a grammatical or a editorial change. It, it, it Does anybody believe we need to bring that to a vote? Can we do it in the title too? Cap, capitalizing chair, saying the cherish and act. Okay. I don't think we need to vote. Thank you. And change the word act above to upper and lower. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Kathy Shane. I'm going to follow Mandy. Actually, I sent in some questions a few hours before we met to say how was the Cherish Act funded and would it absorb all the money in the fair share that was allocated? And the initial response was good questions. I wonder how it is. So we it, they went out to the other person who's named on this, the original sponsor, and he said, he sent me the current allocation of the fair share amendment, which has basically nothing for K through 12, except for, and it's a big except, some money to MSBA to do some capital projects, but it has nothing that's on the funding side to fix what we've got with the charter formula and the chapter 70. So I do think um, having worked for years on healthcare policy that if we wanted to expand a major program, we had to say where the money was coming from to fund it. Mm -hmm. And that was at the federal level. I think you need to do it at the state level. And we certainly in the town, we can't deficit spend in the town. Um, so I just want, since our Senator Comerford is a sponsor of this, I would like to know how we can do both because we can't, we know what we're facing this year. We're not talking about next year for our elementary school, and we have a huge gap. So if we basically take the money that we thought was gonna help with K through 12 by enacting a new draw on it, and there's not another new source. So I don't know how, and there's nothing wrong with the Cherish Act. It's just, I wanna know how we're gonna pay for it. So it, this is an unusual request, but could we hear from our Senator? how she, both she and Mindy, initially when they were elected on the right-hand side on Joe, but way back in 2018, they ran on bringing more funds in for education, um, knowing that we were 
facing pre-COVID, we were facing a problem. So I'm really worried about the funding, not what this act is going to do. And this is what has always tied up big improvements at the federal level. And the federal level can just deficit spend, but this, the state is starting to say we don't have surpluses anymore, and they're starting to say we're cutting. So I think we're um, in a world where resolutions aren't just resolutions. We should be asking ourselves how we're going to pay for it. Jennifer Taub. So just to, um, I guess, basically ask a question of, of Kathy to follow up. So is the request maybe that we not vote on this tonight, but wait to hear back from uh, Senator uh, Comerford? Was that kind of the gist of what you were asking? I'm, I'm, I'm asking, am I correct that this would absorb all the money? And I didn't get a clear answer. They said this year's money, and they sent, I got sent this year's money, and this year's money has nothing for K through 12. So if right. next year's money has more for for higher education, then there won't be more for K through 12. So it's, it's a question, Jennifer, I don't know because this is an awkward thing. There's nothing wrong with this legislation. Um, Excuse but, me. But, but I'm assuming at the state level, they can't pass a piece of legislation without funding it. So I'm hoping that's true. But if it collides with the efforts to get more money for our schools, I'd like to know that. Thank you. So I guess I'm just kind of putting out there, do we want to have that? Do we want to know before we vote on this if we're not, what is it, taking from Peter to pay Paul, so to speak? You know, if there's a real, there could be an impact from. Uh, thank you just for asking guess. that question. I'm going to uh, recognize one of the sponsors, Pat. Ian might be able to answer Kathy's question. Um, is that all right, Council? Uh, yeah. Is there any objection to that? Yes, but Ian, can you tell me about I mean, no mm -hmm. objection. I'm sorry. About yeah, thank you. Um, so just in terms of the fair share budgets for this year, uh, there were $224 million that went to uh, public K-12 through and $229 million that went to uh, public higher ed. Um, and so that's for uh, FY24, and it would be similar budgets in FY25 and 26 uh, when Cherish would go into effect, um, similar similar to this year. So it's the sheet you sent me, right? Which, yes. which it went for construction dollars to repair schools. Yeah. It didn't go directly to K through 12. That's... It's in the K through 12 category. Preschool, that didn't go through K through 12. Excuse me. So we, I'm just saying, it was very helpful that you sent this. So I don't know whether that money goes away and now is freed up for real K through 12 or whether all of that money then goes. So it's uh, everyone should get this sheet of paper because it, it does have K through 12 money, but it's not to the schools to pay for education. I'm, okay. If, no. Thank you, Ian. We appreciate your being here and your response. If there was a sheet of paper with information, it should be filed with the with the clerk of the council, and the council clerk of the council can add it to the packet. Second of all, we are not going to take the time tonight to get into debate what the split is on the budget for the um, fair share. Uh, that's not the purpose of this um, this resolution. I think we need to take any other comments on this resolution and then bring it to a vote. If there are issues that mean you want to know more about the Fair Share Act, then somebody needs to make a res a um, motion to delay voting on this. Okay, um, Councillor Walker. Um, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit further on what Ian said. It's just my understanding that there are two different funding streams for K through 12 and for the fair share amendment portion that's being allocated. And we don't necessarily have the discretion to decide how that money is used as the Amherst Town Council, unfortunately. 
Um, and I think that that's something we can look at and think about another time if we think that the K through 12 money should be used for other things, but that's just separate from the Cherish Act. Um, and so I like absolutely appreciate some of the concerns tonight and I don't disagree at all. Um, I know our K through 12 is in urgent need of funding, but I think multiple things can be true at the same time and it shouldn't prevent us from addressing some of the other things that are also true. Thank you, uh, Andy Steinberg. I do make the motion to uh, postpone consideration um, to a date certain. And I uh, guess what our next meeting is uh, the 26th of February. I'll make the motion to uh, postpone consideration till February 26th. Is there a second? Second. Councillor Ette is the second. Is there, we're going to immediately then move to, is there any other comments? Councillor Walker. Um, I just have a quick clarifying question for um, Andy. Um, would the hope for postponing be that we could get more information from or have some of our um, reps come speak with us? I'm just trying to understand the point of the postponing. Andy. I think it would give us the opportunity to um, get information from a variety of sources uh, about where what the fair share amendment uh, allocation has been so far, because that has not been entirely clear, and an opportunity to consult with our legislators, our state representative and state senator regarding the question of. Uh, whether this will allow opportunity for um, additional funding for K-12 education. Okay. Motion's been made to postpone to a date certain. Pat, you have a question or comment? Yes, if counselors wanted, had questions that they wanted Joe Comerford or Mindy Dom to answer, they could have reached out to them. Uh, so to postpone, voting on whether or not uh, to pass this resolution to support the Cherish Act. I don't understand why that has to go back. Um, I, I just don't understand. The May I mention that we do have a, our monthly meeting coming up with these um, with the senator and the state representative, and we can ask this question or we can ask additional questions. But what does um, that have to do with passing this? this it's, season? it's, I'm just mentioning that it's there. It's, I didn't say it had anything to do with it, but will you will be getting a request from myself and the vice president for questions that you would like us to ask of the senator and the representative. That's all. George Ryan, you have your hand up. I assume Dom and Comerford are thinking about this a lot, but that's their problem, not ours. Um, we're being asked to send this along with our strong support, and it's their job to figure it out. And maybe the answer is the people in Boston are going to have to figure out a better way to fund K through 12. But we are saying there's a real need here, and we hear it, and we want you to act on it. And in fact, both Comerford and Dom support this legislation. So I assume they've given a fair amount of thought to it. They're not just throwing it out there. So I don't see any point in postponing. I don't can imagine what they're going to tell us. It's going to suddenly have our eyes open up and go, oh, I see. Now it's all, it's not going to be easy. It's never going to be easy. Sources are limited. That's not our job. Our job, I think here, is to send a clear message to Boston that we want you to do something about this now. Councillor Walker. Um, thank you. I agree with Councillor Ryan, and I just wanted to add that I think that even if we pass this tonight, there's still time to ask questions of our state reps, and there's still time to speak with them if you have if you would like to advocate for different allocations within what is happening. But I don't think that that has any impact on us passing our support for the Cherish Act. Andy Steinberg. It would give us the opportunity to amend the language in the um, resolution in support of the Cherish Act to include a statement that we value 
education at all levels and uh, the town has responsibilities for um, education and concerns for education at all levels. And as uh, uh, the, it emphasizes that we are supporting both and that this is not stated to be a higher priority. Um, I'm concerned that the resolution as uh, stated now um, creates the implication that it's a priority over um, increased funding that would assist the chapter 70 funding that has been wholly inadequate and uh, has been uh, being depleted because we've been getting such small um, increases to the Student Opportunity Act. And uh, I get, it gets back to the question as to uh, having these kinds of discussions in the full council is valuable, but it is also time consuming. And which is why I think that we also, as a matter of course, need to be thinking about whether GOL is the only place that um, a resolution should go to if the limitation of discussion is clarity, consistency, and actionability. Okay. The motion on the floor is to postpone to a date certain. That date certain is February 26th. Um, and we're going to vote on that motion. And then depending on the outcome of that motion, we'll come back to the original motion. We're going to start this vote with Councillor Haneke. No. Bob Hagner. No. Councillor Lord is absent. Uh, Pam Rooney? No. Councillor Ryan? No. Kathy Shane? No. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Jennifer Taub? No. Councillor Walker? No. Pat DeAngelis? No. Anna Devlin Gothier? No. Councillor Ette. Yes. And Lynn Griesmer is a no. That is 10, uh, one, I'm sorry, two in favor, 10 opposed, and one absent. Did we now go back to the original motion? And the original motion is to adopt the resolution in support of higher ed for all as amended. That motion's been made and seconded. We'll move immediately to the question. Andy, you have your hand up. I don't think you mean to. Okay. Uh, we're going to start this case with Councillor Hegner. I mean, Bob Hegner. Aye. Uh, Councillor Lord's absent. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Councillor Ette? Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke? No. The resolution passes with 11 in favor, one opposed, and one absent. We're going to take a brief five minute break and then come back for our action items. Please take your picture, your video off and your audio off. Thank you.
We're going to reconvene in two minutes. In all levels. I imagine you have a dartboard at home with our face. <laughs> no. It's like hurting the, uh, no, it's so hard. Yeah. Everything. Okay, counselors, if you are back, please turn on your video. I'm going to ask the clerk of the council to remove the screen so I can see people. George. Uh, welcome back. Whoops, welcome back. We're now moving into a part of the agenda, which this is the first time this council has dealt with. And so let me just mention, based on the charter, we are keepers of the public way. That means anytime anybody wants to do something to public property, which includes our roads, our parks, our sidewalks, they have to come to us. And based on five years of work with the council, we have actually developed a policy about the use of the public way. Tonight we have before us three different request, requests with regard to the public way. And so um, with that, I'm going to, we're going to start with a request from Amherst College. Before we do that, I believe um, Councilor Haneke has raised her hand. Thank you. Um, I just need to make a oral disclosure that um, there is an appearance of conflict because my husband is an employee of Amherst College um, and I've filed that general notice with the town clerk as a general disclosure, um, but I try to announce it at every time there's an item with Amherst College there, but I'm not recusing myself because I feel that on this matter, um, I can perform my official duties objectively and fairly. Thank you. Anna Devlin Goth here. Um, second verse, same as the first. I am employed by Amherst College. I have filed the general disclosure that is at the town clerk's office. Um, I am not seeing a reason where this would conflict or be a true conflict of interest, so I do not plan to recuse myself. If something changes and I deem that it is one, I will recuse myself, but based on what's in the packet, I do not believe it will be in conflict. Thank you. Thank you. And let me just say, I appreciate when counselors recognize the potential of a conflict and they have done what is appropriate, and that is to file the proper forms. Uh, with that, we're going to start with um, a request for a permanent change uh, to place an Amherst College sign at the intersection of College Street and South Pleasant Street. And let me just mention that 
I'm going to place a motion on the table, and then we're going to move to presentations, et cetera. The motion is to refer the request to place an Amherst College sign in the public way at the corner of College Street and South Pleasant Street to the Town Services and Outreach Committee with report and recommendation to the Town Council by March 18th, 2024. Is there a second? Second the Andrews. Thank you. Then with that, I am going to call on our count, our, Paul, did you have anything you wanted to say in advance? Okay. Then I'm going to call on the sponsors of this request and ask that they, Seth, um, Seth Wilschitz, and I am sure I mispronounced you. No, you did pretty good. Okay. Um, Seth, please proceed. Identify yourself and then proceed. Good evening, everyone. My name is Seth. I am the assistant, Seth Walshus. I'm the assistant director of planning, design, and, co and construction for Amherst College. And I hope everyone is having a wonderful evening tonight. So in 2021, we were in front of your committee, uh, your town council uh, on this signage program. The college uh, back in like 2019, realized that we really needed to up our wayfinding and signage program. We effectively had no signs on campus, and that is mostly still true, but what we were working to fix, and you really had to know where you were going and what you were looking for to find anything on the campus. And so as part of a comprehensive signage program, we hired um, a signage designer named Rol Baresi, and we developed a full comprehensive package that includes place marking, uh, parking signs, vehicular directional signs, pedestrian directional signs, and building signs. And some of the prototypes are now up. You might have seen there's a, a Amherst College sign at the entrance, uh, the East Drive entrance off of College Street. That's a prototype sign. Uh, so we're starting to install these. There's more coming. We worked very closely with Christine, Christine Brestrup, who is, of course, here and went through the Historical Commission, the Design Review Board, the Planning Board, and a few meetings with the Town Council, and we worked through all of the signs except for one. And so we are here today, for, uh, three years later, to try and ask again for approval for one additional sign. This is one of the place marking signs, we call it one of our gateway signs. We are proposing it at the intersection of College Street and South Pleasant, it's on the southeast corner. So as you come up from Northampton Road, that's a perfect spot. As we come up from Northampton Road, which is sort of visible on the left of the screen, you would cross that intersection and it's on the town common, which of course is land that the town owns and the college manages. If we go to the next slide, please. It is a metal sign, the, the purple portion of it and the white portion is a metal curved sign that is a deep aubergine color with white lettering, of course, that says Amherst College. And it is on a um, granite block at both ends. And the granite block on the right uh, turns into a, a small little seat wall. It is very, very similar in design to one that you've already approved, which is at the other uh, location we intend to install this, which is at the uh, near the entry to the athletics down on south, further south on South Pleasant. That one was approved in 2021 and we will be pulling a building permit uh, for it here soon. And really this is um, the entirety of what we've come here today for. Um, the sign has not changed in its location or in its design. There's one more slide you can see a little bit of a detail. We worked with MassDOT when they were doing this work to work on some of the pedestrian improvements at this intersection, which the college helps fund um, and the, helps tie in the sign. So you can see the little purple stripe, which is, which is kind of barely visible, is the actual metal portion. And then there's a, there's a granite pier at the far end that supports it. And then a seat wall that you can set where it says 18, it should say it says 18 feet, but it should say 18 inch seat wall. Um, that kind of that kind of forms uh, as you come south onto South Pleasant, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, we now move to the portion of the meeting which is council discussion. Remember, this is a referral to TSO. We are not voting tonight on this request. 
Pam Rooney. Thank you. I am delighted to see this signage. I think um, I'm just very happy to see Amherst College recognized on the street. Um, I did have one question. I would love to have it discussed in a little more detail. Given the height of this sign and its and its proximity to the corner, um, I did some measurements and I recognized that the sign in its total is at least three and a half feet high at the higher end of the of the um, sign. And the one question that I would like addressed is if we have cars that are driving north on 116 coming up through the intersection um, as they move toward, toward downtown and a car is coming west on College Street toward the intersection and that car is planning to just kind of check for traffic and, and pull to the right and go north as well on North Pleasant Street, South Pleasant Street. Is the car coming on College Street really going to be able to see the oncoming car on 116 South Pleasant Street? And I would just like um, if it's if it's possible possible for TSO to discuss perhaps pulling it back from the corner slightly. Um, a couple of feet might make a difference so that there's greater visibility for the two cars coming toward the same intersection. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Councillor Haneke. Um, as with the request from two years ago, my biggest concern is about the size of this sign. Um, Pam talked about some of it um, from the drawings and from the specs you gave. It looks like it's at least four feet high on one end, um, two feet high for the Amherst College sign itself. Um, is what it's marked as, if I'm reading this correctly. That's a huge height for a sign, two feet high. Um, 18 foot long for just the purple, but this diagram says that the seat wall is also 18 feet long, but does not say how much of that seat wall extends beyond the 18 foot Amherst College purple sign. So this sign might be 30 plus feet long when you include all of the seat walls. That is a huge sign in my mind um, and a lot of space. And so I'm, I'm curious why it needs to be so big. Um, the Amherst, welcome to Amherst signs for the, the town wayfinding we just did are not that big as far as I know. I'd love to compare those sizes like the welcome to Amherst sign we put on the corner of Triangle and Main, for example, um, and and why this sign needs to be so much larger. Um, I'm also curious, you, you might have mentioned this, but there's a lot of this rough cobble and all. Is that already done? Is it intended to be done? Who's going to pay for it? Um, and is the view shed we've got on, I guess it's page three of this, is that the current one or is that the old one from two years ago or does it show all of the upgrades from the intersection that was just done in terms of where the crossing beacons will be and any of the signs that have been added for wayfinding for the town and all of that so that we can really get a, a good feel of this intersection that at that corner is getting a whole lot of signs potentially put on. Um, and so, yeah, those are my biggest questions and concerns. Seth, did you want to address any of those at this time? Yeah, or I can wait. Uh, um, so we can certainly study um, if it needs to be pulled back from the corner. We did uh, fund the improvements to that corner through the MassDOT program. The rest of anything, of course, that's additional, it's related to just the sign itself, you know, reseeding the area of disturbance, all of that, of course, would be on our tab. Um, the height at the high end is primarily driven by the grade. There is a tremendous amount of grade as we come around the corner. And so, of course, the sign is staying level um, and the grade is falling off. And so it's not so much that the sign, of course, is becoming taller. It's just that the grade's falling. Um, although, of course, we could study if there's a, a, a another height that makes more sense as it comes around. Um, I do I do not have a, a precise measurement, although I can get one for how much of the seat wall is exposed after the sign, but it's it's most of the seat wall. So there's probably 
looking at the graphic on the uh, last page of the presentation, it looks like, you know, maybe maybe a, a third-ish of the seat wall is covered by the sign, but the rest of it is exposed. Mindy, Joe, did that answer your questions? It means my oh. estimate of about 30 feet for the entire length of the, 30 feet plus for the entire length of the sign is, is fairly accurate then. Thank you. And sorry, Mandy, I meant to also say that the rendering is the old rendering, and we were hap I can happily update that for the TSO present the TSO meeting. For that today. would be very useful. Thank you. Uh, there were questions earlier about traffic visibility. Did you have any response to any of those questions as you were developing this? Yeah, I, uh, um, because it's curved and follows the curvature of the sidewalk, I, and it you know it's I think it's below where, where most people would be looking. I think. I don't think it would be a, a, an issue, but I think we can model it more carefully as part of the TSO with a like a SketchUp model and, and show actual vantage points as you come around the corner, which I think would be helpful. Thank you. That would be Andy Steinberg. Yeah. Yes, I just wanted to uh, remind counselors who forgot the discussion for before and and for counselors who are not involved in the discussion from before to make sure that they understand that the land we're talking about is actually a part of the town common. It is not part of Amherst College land so that we are not only allowing, uh, it's not just about the sign, but it is about um, giving consent to putting the um, a sign on land that belongs to the town and is part of the public way because commons are part of the public way. And that's why it falls into this uh, rather um, unusual, because you wouldn't think the signs would necessarily be uh, in our uh, charge, but it is. Um, and uh, the, there was an agreement made some years ago that I recall looking at, but it's been a long time since I've looked at it, where the college agreed to um, provide maintenance for that section of the commons since it was really adjacent to its uh, main campus and not a part of our major common. Okay, thank you. Bob Hagner. Yeah, I, I share the concerns that the sign may be a little bit too large. And my concern is people coming up the hill on Northampton Road may be distracted by this sign um, and miss the other signs uh, and get confused and not be sure which lane to be in if they want to make a left turn there. So I, I, I would tone it down a little bit. I think it's too big. Are there any other questions or comments or? Yes, Anna. Uh, first off, I really appreciated the description of purple as dark aubergine. Um, that brought me joy. So the second thing was, um, I, I what I'd like, it's actually not a request from, from Amherst College. It's a request from TSO. I would really love if TSO could, um, when you report back on this, if you could rehash a bit of the conversation from the first time this came around, if, if that's possible. If I'm asking too much, tell me and I can do it myself. Um, but if there are minutes on this, I think I... I remember tuning it. I was not on the council at the point when this was first discussed. And there was a lot of conversation about use of community space and how do we ensure our community still feels free to use that space. And so what I would love TSO to, to either remind us of is the conversation about how we can ensure that our community still knows that this space is accessible and open to them and that it is not um, in fact closed off for some reason. Um, I know that our community is welcome to walk through Amherst College's campus as well, but this land specifically is town land, and I'd love to figure out how there might be a way to make sure that that is clear, uh, that this is a space for, for our community at their leisure to enjoy. Um, and I believe that was already discussed. So I'm just, I'm trying to avoid having the entire conversation again. If TSO can pull some of those records and bring us forward on it, that would be helpful. Um, I'm so with that request, I'll ask the town clerk that we make sure that the minutes from that meeting uh, be included in the TSO packet for when they discuss this. Uh, Bob Hegner, you have your hand up. Uh, sorry, I didn't take it down. Okay. Uh, this is the opportunity for counselors 
to make sure that TSO as a committee hears your concerns so that when they have the meeting and come back to us with a recommendation, they have addressed those concerns. Are there any other items you would like TSO to make sure they address during their meeting? Okay, seeing none, Seth, thank you for joining us. And thank you. we'll see you, um, I, I'm sorry, we need to vote on the referral. Um, which is that it would come back to us on March 18th. So the vote motion's been made and seconded. Seeing no further comments, we're going to move to a vote. I'm going to start with Bob Hegner. Aye. Um, Pam Rooney? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Aye. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councillor Walker? She's absent is uh, absent. absent at the moment. Okay. As is, by the way, Councillor Lord. Um, Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna devlin Goth here. Aye. Uh, Councillor Ette? Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Joe, I'm sorry, Councillor Haneke? Aye. It's unanimous with 11 voting in favor for referral and two uh, absent. We're going to move on to the next item. Pam, you. you have your Good hand night. up. Point of order. Yes. There's so there's nothing in this uh, in our action items that actually said referral to TSO. I thought we were actually voting on it tonight, so that's a surprise. Um, what about the other public way request number two and number three? Are those the same? Are they getting referred to TSO, or are we voting tonight? Uh, the motion on your sheet, in fact, was to refer to TSO. It's the motion sheet, and the motion, as I read it, was to refer the request to place an Amherst College sign in the public way at the corner of College Street and South Pleasant Street to the Town Services and Outreach Committee with a report and recommendation to the Town Council by March 18th, 2024. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, we're going to move on to the second item in under the public way and again, in this case, it's a very different item. Pat, you have your hand up. I was wondering if we could take action item three before action item two. Uh, that we look at the, the Meadows subdivision first and then look at the other. Is there any objection to that from the council? I'd like to hear why. Pat, why? Because I, I feel like that the issue has been hanging around for a very, very, very long time. And I'd like to have it clear that we have an up and down vote about it uh, before I go ahead and have any response to the second item. Anna? I disagree. I do not think they should be conditional on one another. I think that we can have an up and down vote on both of these items as they are listed on our agenda. Okay, unless there's a motion to change the order of the agenda. Uh, Andy, you have your hand up. Yes. Um, yes, I was just trying to get up. This is a topic that I was uh, thinking about um, also because we had a very explicit problem last time and um, in the discussion with the homeowners in uh, Hopbrook and Kester Lane, they were very concerned that um, there not be a decision about uh, the Meadows uh, or about uh, Amherst Hills until there was clarity about the, uh, theirs because it's the same developer. And uh, the question was whether the development uh, or, or the approval of the of one would take away incentive to tie the two together and say, you've got to solve the problem for Hopbrook and Kestrel satisfactorily. And I think that that was a fairly strong position taken by the Hopbrook and Kestrel homeowners. And uh, so I think that the two are 
uh, historically um, and in fact, um, intricately connected. So a motion's been made. Has a motion been made? No. Um, let me also point, I, while you're thinking about that, I want to point out that the motions on the sheet are two very different motions. First of all, there is no motion on the sheet for Hopbrook and Kestrel. Second, because that is pending our discussion. Second, the motion on the sheet, on the motion sheet for Amherst uh, Hills is a referral. It's a referral to the planning board, which is a step that has to be taken before it can come back to the council. The actual um, Kestrel Hopbrook um, roads have already been to the planning board because we referred it to the planning board back in 2022, and that planning board report is in your packet. So they are two different motions. We cannot even, if we wanted to, we can't even act on Amherst Hills tonight in terms of actually accepting it. All we can do is refer it to the planning board. On the other hand, uh, Hopbrook and Kestrel have been through the planning board. They've gone to the finance committee. They have, um, this is an issue that the town manager will speak to, but he has spent time working on this. And so um, that's, um, there are two different actions that would take place. Andy, you have your hand up? No, I'll take it down. Okay. So unless I hear a motion to change the order of the agenda, I'm going to go with um, the Amherst Hills first. Okay. Um, the, the motion that I'm placing on the table and looking for a second is the town council hereby declares its intention to lay out Hawthorne Road, Concord Way, and Linden Ridge Road, excluding the cul-de-sac as public ways and to refer the layout and plan to the planning board for its review in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 41, S81G to, um, to 81I, and with report back to the town council within 45 days from this referral. Is there a second? Second, Rooney. Thank you. Uh, so at that point, I'm going to now ask the sponsor to, um, Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. Okay. Uh, the sponsor to come forward and make a statement. Who is making the statement for this one? Ted Parker? So let me, let me can I get precise? Please, I, why don't you go ahead, Paul? So thank you. Um, so this is a request that came to into the council to accept these roads as public ways. I'm also joined here by our planning director, Chris Brestrup, and uh, superintendent of public works, Guilford Mooring. I think he's in the audience. He's here, okay, uh, good. Uh, and we have neighbors here who live on the road and um, in, in addition to developer, uh, Ted Parker, if he's in the room or not, I'm not sure. He's in the, on Zoom. He's on Zoom. Um, so this is a request that came in, that, and the, we're following the same process that we did with the Hopbrook or the Meadows subdivision, which includes Hopbrook and, and Kestrel Lane. It comes into the council. It gets referred to the planning board. The planning board has a certain number of days, 45 days, to, re to review it, and it comes back to you. And then you have the opportunity to accept it or not accept it or do whatever you, you want to do with it. Um, I, you have a memo in your packet that gives some background, some history for it, um, where, what the current status is, and, the, and some recommendations for the types of information you should request. I believe you should request of the um, town engineer uh, when you get into more details of whether to accept the road or not. So, and I think there are people here from the, from the neighborhood who would like to make a, a, discuss, make a presentation to you. Okay, meantime, um, Councillor Walker has rejoined us. I just need to make sure that Councillor Walker, you can hear us and we can hear you. Yes, I can. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Okay, uh, who is going to go first for this? Please come. Okay, the petitioner is, is Ted Parker, right? Ted, are you? 
Mr. Parker, are you prepared to come forward? We're bringing you into the room. Okay, would you like to make a statement at, with regard to this petition? Ted Parker, you need to unmute. Would you like to make a statement with regard to this petition? Thank you. Yes, um, thank you. I don't think I have anything to add to our request, to the Fino's request. Uh, it, it's pretty self-explanatory. Okay. Um, then we are open to other people who are in the audience. Is there anybody on Zoom? I just want to make sure that is going to make a statement about this request. I see none, so please come forward. Please state your name and where you live and your association with us. There's a, uh, yes. Sorry. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, good evening. My name is James Master Alexis. I live at 35 Linden Ridge Road in Amherst, which is the Amherst Hills neighborhood. And my association here is I am the, excuse me, the group leader of 32 people who live in the neighborhood, 32 families mm -hmm. uh, in Amherst Hills. And um, we're coming here for you tonight to support the petition of Tofino Associates uh, for tonight's meeting to simply refer this map matter to the planning board. And um, the reason why we're doing that is the roads in this neighborhood, and this isn't from me, this is from your town engineer, and I don't want to put words in Mr. Skeel's uh, mouth here, but the roads in Amherst Hills have been completed. Um, they're in really good shape, and as such, um, we believe that eventually when you go through this process, you should accept these roads as public ways. As evidence of that, um, there's a 700-foot section of Concord Way in the beginning of the neighborhood and that section of Amherst Hills has been accepted as a public way already in the town of Belchertown. The land lies in Belchertown. So that's evidence that that neighboring town has accepted those roads as public ways. Um, so we would ask that when the process is complete and after you get your referral from the planning board, that you would vote in the affirmative this evening to refer it and eventually do it at that point. And I also would like to say, um, our neighborhood has been through four years of legal wrangling in this matter. I'm not going to get into it, but it's been a long slog of a bit of a fight. Okay, And I would ask the council to not delay this matter at all. I would also like to ask the council, in your deliberations and in your thoughts, to consider our neighborhood independent from any other neighborhood in the town. Yes, there is a commonality of the same developer, but the facts are different. And the facts of our neighborhood situation is the roads are complete. Your engineer has reviewed them. There's no work, and the engineer and the town manager can discuss this, but there's no work that needs to be done. Please consider our neighborhood independent of any other problem. And I'm not saying there's no problems and I'm not taking sides, but you need to consider, in my opinion, our neighborhood independent of any other problems that you may have because it, is, because it is not fair to our neighborhood to delay this matter for things that have nothing to do with where we live. So with that, I wanna say thank you very much and that's all I have to say. And thank you for listening, uh, Madam President. Thank you. Is there anybody else from the neighborhood that we're discussing that would like to come forward? Again, please state your name and where you live, John. Uh, I'm John Kennedy. I'm, I live at 36 Linden Ridge Road. Is the green light on? Yeah. I, okay. John Kennedy. I live at 36 Linden Ridge Road in Amherst. You need um, to move closer to, closer the, to the mic. Closer to the mic. Can you hear me now? Okay, that's fine. Look, the, the, the situations between these two neighborhoods are substantively different. The uh, roads in Amherst Hills have been completed to the specifications of the town as required by the subdivision agreement when the, when the subdivision was laid out. Um, the only um, similarity is it's the same developer, but the conditions are different, the circumstances are different, the towns are, the roads are completed in Amherst Hills, again, to the specs of the town. Um, and um, the, the 
denial of these roads it will have no negative impact on Tofino. They will only have a negative impact on the residents of our community and will have no positive impact on what goes on at the Meadows. These are two very separate instant, uh, uh, situations, very separate uh, conditions of the roads, very separate sets of circumstances. And we urge you once again, as, as my colleague and neighbor, Jim Master Alexis said, to consider these two situations differently. Our, um, our, our situation and our roads have not gone to the planning board yet. They haven't been referred down there. The, the roads in the other, other neighborhood have. So we ask you that consider these separately, consider the, the distinct and different situations of these roads. And again, the roads in this neighborhood are completed to the specifications of the town. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other people who would like to comment with regard to neighbors who would like to comment with regard to this? Okay, council discussion, Mandy Joe. Thank you. I just have two sort of um, clarification or requests for clarity or mm -hmm. stuff. The first one is the motion says Linden Ridge Road excluding the cul-de-sac. Um, there's been no description as to exactly what part of the road is being excluded. Um, so I would just like, you know, the as this process moves forward, I'm not going to ask for an amendment to the motion. I believe the intention is that the Road Linden Ridge Road shown on the plan that is north of the intersection with Concord Road or Concord Way, I guess it is, is what is excluded from what I can tell in some other comments that were made in memos about 800 feet of road and doing my own measurements and all versus the cul de sac, which is literally a round circle. Um, so I just, I, I think we need more specification as we move through the process as to what part of Linden Ridge Road is included in this request and exactly what part is not on the sheets um, instead of just this vague excluding the cul-de-sac. And then the second thing is when I was reading your memo, the memo from the town manager, there was an indication that said that there was going to be a request or is a request to accept the associated wastewater pumping station on Station Road and all cross country sewer and drainage easements. Um, we don't have a motion to accept all of that. We don't have a motion to refer the acceptance of all of that somewhere. Should we be referring the request or the intention and to um, accept the associated wastewater pumping station and all cross country sewer and drainage eas easements. What are we doing with that 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 wording that was included in the manager's yeah. memo about things he that we should be doing? And so it's another clarification of should we have another motion tonight that refers that to TSO for consideration um, and with mapping as to what those easements would be and how we would accept them. Okay, um, I'm going to call on the town manager, Paul. Yes, yeah, so I think you, you can include that in the motion. Uh, uh, it probably is, is a good idea to do it. I think one of the things in my memo is to request an updated plan. The plan is what will define what is accepted by the by the town and get an updated plan that shows the actual meets and bounds of what is being accepted. Where And I think the town, attorney, the town attorney has recommended that we, on the plan, there be a line drawn saying end of public way, beginning of public way. So it's very clearly defined for anybody well into the future to see what what has been accepted and what has not been accepted. So that's during the process, we would ask that, you know, during the planning board process that that map be updated. And then that is what would come back to the council for its action. Okay, so that answers the first question, um, that there will be an update that, that comes to TSO, yep. correct? Will that also, the planning board, I'm sorry, that will, that will be updated before it goes to the planning board. And Guilford was here and he had his hand up if he wanted to talk about the Guilford. wastewater. Mr. Yeah, Mr. Boring, please go ahead. Sorry, wrong button. Yes, I mean, in this process in the past, uh, once you accept the meets and bounds and layouts of the subdivision, you also accept all the sewer that has been agreed to in the subdivision application and all the water infrastructure. So all that is included in the acceptance. Um, just so you know, the water and sewer has unofficially been accepted by the town and we've maintained it since it's been functional and the subdivision has been in service. But 
at residents and the developer have not maintained or had to maintain the water and sewer at, up, up until now. Okay. Uh, Ted Parker, you have your hand up. Yes, I was just going to mention that our request in response to um, Councilor Haneke's uh, comment, our request did specify a specific uh, station, which is a uh, an accounting of the road length where our request stopped so that the cul-de-sac was very clearly excluded from our request. Uh, just last week, uh, um, Paul asked uh, that additional information be added to a plan um, and we have agreed to produce that plan so that the actual uh, meets and bounds, this is all a little bit technically you know, jargony, but so that there's actually a plan that very clearly defines what the limit of what we're requesting be accepted, be uh, incorporated onto a plan. So it, it, was, it, was, it was very specific. The re our request was very specific. Uh, that's it. Thank you. I want to go back to the second question, though. It's around the old sewer, et cetera. Do we need to amend this motion or have an additional motion? And does that motion need to have us refer this to TSO? So I don't think it needs to be amended because, as Guilford said, everything that's on the plan is accepted by the town, including the the, the the you know the services are underground as long as it's within the right of way and that that's what the plan would show the substation oh, okay uh mandy joe go ahead um from what i could tell though on the plan there looked like there were some cross-country sewer parts that were not part of the public way unless at least not part of under the road public way. That's where I'm confused when it says we would accept that if we're accepting and doing easements not under the public way. Is that part of this motion already or is that need to be something else? And that the plan was very hard to read in black and white um, to get that indication. Um, so I, I just want to make sure we're covering all of our bases. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that Mandy, I mean, Councillor Hanneke, uh, Ted Parker. I would like to add that uh, I also submitted to uh, Paul last week. Uh, we we had a lawyer draft both the deed to uh, transmit the title to the property to the, to the town and uh, the common areas in the subdivision to the homeowners association, but also there are pretty uh, clearly uh, drawn out deeds uh, conveying easements uh, to the town for access on property that the town does not own. I don't think that the entire uh, pumping, sewage ejector pumping station is in the right of way. I believe that some of it is on an open space parcel that will be conveyed to the HOA, but an easement uh, to access that to the town is uh, has been drafted and is part of this entire process. Guilford. So when the subdivision process started, all the easements that you're talking about were included in that process and meant to be accepted when they accept the subdivision in its entirety. So as you accept the roads, you'll also accept all the infrastructure to, su to support it. Um, I don't think there's a need for a separate uh, motion to do that in this. Okay. So what I'm hearing is that the referral to the planning board includes um, all of the information that has been discussed here, including the sewer and so sewer, et cetera. And therefore, when the planning board comes back with their recommendation, that is sufficient to accept it all. That's what I'm hearing. Andy Joe, yes. Okay. Are there any other questions with regard to this referral? Are there any things that we would like to convey to the planning board that they look at? Is there anything else on this one? Seeing none, then we're going to move it to a vote. And this is a vote for referral. It's not a vote for acceptance. And I'm going to start with Pam Rooney. Yes. 
Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Patty Angelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Yes. And Councillor Lord is absent. It's unanimous with one absent. We're going to move to the next one. And this is the, I'm going to, I don't have a motion, okay? Um, I'm sorry. Chris, I'm, I'm going to, first of all, let me just introduce this. This is regarding Castro Lane and Hopbrook. It is another subdivision. And uh, as we will hear, this has been going on for a while. Chris, I'm going to ask you to make your statement, if you will. And then I'm going to move to sponsor statements. I wasn't planning to make a statement about this. I can if you would like me to, but I was going to go back to the motion that you just voted on and to make sure that you included your intention to lay out the road because right before the vote, you said this this was a vote on the referral to the planning board. And I wanted to make sure that that um, vote included your intention to lay out the road. The way the motion reads is the town council hereby declares its intention to lay out Hawthorne Road, et cetera. Thank so you. yes, it already, it was in the vote to refer. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, with that, I'm going to move to ask uh, Doug, I believe you're coming up first, right? Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. Did you want to start? Sure, let, let I think I it. think we should start with yeah, Paul. I'll yes. do it like the last time. So, Please. to give some background, there's a, again again a memo in your packet that gives some background. This this had come before the council um, previously. The council referred it to the planning board. The planning board referred it back. There's a substantial amount of work that needs to be done on the um, on the roads before the town engineer field would recommend you accept it. Um, this was discussed at the finance committee. The finance committee charged me with trying to figure out a way to pay for the improvements that need to be made. Um, I've had conversation, we've, I've talked with the town engineer to get like the essential things that need to be done to accept the road. I've worked with the neighborhood, uh, the homeowners association has agreed to put a contribution into it. Uh, I have committed, been willing to look at putting town funds into it. And we looked at a sort of a tripartite um, uh, solution to getting the roads paved. Um, the developer has declined to put any additional money in than what they've already um, put in. So that's where it stands. We do, you're, you, you asked me to come up with a financial solution. I was, I was unable to, to do that. So that's, and, then, and then homeowners are saying, well, where do we stand? Let's bring it back to the council. And with this, new, with this information, you can ask you for your judgment. Okay. So we're going to move to sponsor comments. Please come forward. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Douglas Donnell, and I live at 46 Hopbrook Road. I am the current president of the Meadows Homeowners Association, which includes 28 households on Hopbrook and Kestrel Roads in South Amherst. Um, we have been here before several times. Uh, this has been going on. Our development was completed in 2004. So we do not want to uh, create a conflict with Amherst Hills. We have great deal of empathy for the residents in that neighborhood. We do not want to block their acceptance. However, we are in a situation that is true, but our two situations are quite different. The commonality is that we have a, the same developer. Our development was completed in 2004 in that uh, the last house was completed in 2004. Um, at that point, somebody must have tried for acceptance because I have a letter from the town engineer refusing acceptance in, sept in August or o October of 2004 and issuing a punch list and modification of the as-built plans. Um, those, that punch list, some items, there was, I don't know how many, maybe 10, 15 items, that's a point of contention, were addressed somewhere in the 2000 and teens, early 2000 and teens. 
Um, and um, the irony is if you guys vote, vote on this again, the town engineer will once again be issuing a recommendation. But the point is, this has gone on for a very long time. So it basically boils down to what is the punch list and who's going to pay for it. And because I could spend a long time about how, what has happened over the ensuing 20 years, um, but the, what I really want to talk about is our situation as homeowners. We are in legal limbo. We have a developer who owns the road, but who does not want to maintain it, nor do they want to finish the punch list. We have a town that won't accept the roads until they're improved, but is reluctant to provide a punch list which would clearly indicate the cost. So I, we, as the association, got an estimate from Warner Brothers based on the 2019 punch list for a cost of $150,000, roughly, including uh, having um, Huntley do a revision of the as built. Uh, but the trouble is we, as homeowners, don't have any agency. We can't contract it. We don't own the roads. And we're not really set up to be a contractor anyways. So what are we to do? We are proposing that we would submit or offer $140,000 towards improvements of these roads. Uh, this would be pending. I'd have to go back to our association and get approval from our members. Um, but we, as an association, have no agency here. It's really up to the town and to the developer to complete this process. So we are asking tonight for you to vote to accept our roads because we've, we've been in limbo now for many, many years. And as time goes on, the roads deteriorate and the costs go up. So thank you again for your attention tonight. Thanks. Are there other people from the subdivision that would like to speak? Please come forward. State your name and where you live. Thank you, Connie. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Just um, make sure you lean into the okay. mic. I will lean in and put on my reading glasses. So if you'll indulge me, I'm a little rusty at doing this, so I'm going to read my remarks. And I try to keep it somewhat brief. Um, I'm Connie Kruger, and I reside at 15 Hopbrook Road. I was employed as a town planner in Amherst for 16 years, from 1986 to 2002. I've also served on a number of boards and committees, including the Select Board, 2014 to 18. In 2021, I joined the Road Committee of my Homeowners Association, and there's a number of uh, other road, a couple of other road committee and other residents here. I hope we'll have time to speak tonight. As your packet shows, the definitive subdivision plan for Hopbrook Road in Casper Lane was approved by the planning board in 1995. In 1999, my partner Susan Tracy and I bought our building lot from Doug Cole. I'm convinced our subdivision would have been completed years ago if Doug hadn't died, but sadly, that is not the case. We purchased our building lot with a reasonable expectation of our road becoming a town road. It was constructed in compliance with both state and local subdivision requirements. While no municipality is required to accept the road, historically, Amherst had always done so once the road was completed. This used to be somewhat regularly done by town meeting, but with large tracts of land not no longer available, you, you don't see very many new subdivisions, and this is the first set of requests this council has seen. In 2001, the planning board voted to approve $130,000 or $10,000 per lot to be put in escrow as each lot was released to the developer. This was surety to guarantee the completion of the subdivision. Surety usually takes the form of funds, a performance bond, or holding of building lots. This surety is to protect the residents in case the project is not completed. The town can use the surety to get the work done. Um, this is done because a developer might go belly up, 
as happened in Amherst Woods with Otto Paparazzo. There might be an untimely death, which happened to our developer, or unscrupulous behavior or just plain incompetence. In 2001, $20,000 was collected from Tofino for the release of two lots. All 28 building lots have now been released and nothing else was ever paid by Tofino. Our position is that Tofino still owes the town the remaining uncollected surety. The town holds approximately $102,000 in a variety of escrow accounts related to the Meadows and to Amherst Hills. We don't think the town should have to shoulder all of Tofino's obligation to complete our subdivision, but should hold these funds and use them to complete the work. There's also unreleased building lots at Amherst Hills. We are not suggesting you don't accept the roads for the residents of Amherst Hills, as you've heard from their sponsors. I don't know of any other subdivision in Amherst that has ever been asked or has offered to pay for the completion of their own roads. We understand that Amherst has many pressing road needs. We drive around in this town and there aren't enough funds to take care of all of it. What we're asking for is a resolution of a problem that has gone unattended for way too long. As residents, we have done everything in our power to bring this issue to completion, and we're asking for your help to get the work done and the roads accepted as town ways. Thank you. Are there other people from the division? Yes, please come forward, and then we'll take you next. Hi, my name is Jesse Ferris from 64 Hopbrook Road in Amherst, and I thank you the members of the town council for allowing us to appear before you tonight. I'm relatively new to this issue and to the neighborhood. I, uh, my wife and I purchased a home uh, at the height of the pandemic almost four years ago, and we're very happy to move to the neighborhood. We're slightly less happy about the orange cone at the end of our driveway on the top of a collapsed uh, drainage um, hole. Um, but we were told that the issue was on its way to resolution. Um, of course, three years later, uh, three and a half years later, the issue seems no closer to resolution. Uh, the manhole at the end of our driveway has completely co collapsed, taking part of our front yard along with it. Um, the post office has already filed two complaints with the town uh, about the danger posed by the collapsed manhole in proximity to the mailbox. Uh, so this is no longer an aesthetic concern. It's a safety issue. Uh, what are we waiting for? For someone to fall in and, and, and injure themselves? So two years ago, I decided to take action and I joined my friends here on the road committee of the um, uh, Homeowners Association to try and come up with a solution. And since then, I've been deeply impressed by the responsible manner, the honest commitment of the homeowners in our neighborhood coming together in good faith to solve an issue in which clearly we have a stake, but for which we are frankly not responsible. Um, I think the time has come for us all to put our heads together and come up with a solution. DPW, Guilford, Jay, we really appreciate what you do, including the fact that you plow our roads, even though, strictly speaking, you don't have to because you don't own them. And we feel your pain. As Connie just said, your budget isn't nearly sufficient to fix all the roads in town. But please don't hold 28 innocent homeowners hostage to resolution of an issue that is much larger than them by moving the goalposts. There was an agreed punch list that included all the things that Tofino should have completed back in the day, but didn't. They have previously agreed to fix all that, right, Ted? But if you now insist that they bring the roads back to their original condition after more than two decades of wear and tear, you're basically killing the deal on the table and making sure this issue never gets resolved or gets resolved at much greater cost to everyone down the road. I think we all know that. Members of the council, you are not personally responsible for the situation, but your predecessors are, as my colleague Connie just reminded us. That 100,000 surety bond that the town decreed but failed to collect from Tofino back in 2001, you know how much it would be if we had put it in account, an interest-bearing account at 5% interest, it would be more than $300,000 today. We would not be having this discussion. 
So the town, I think it's clear, also has a historic obligation to fix this problem, an obligation to the original homeowners, many of whom are here today, retired university professors, retired town employees, retired contractors, but also to all the newcomers who have inherited a mess that they have nothing to do with and are, as, as Doug mentioned, powerless to, to resolve. And lastly, Ted, as the representative of Tofino, this is really simple. You own the roads, we don't. You built beautiful homes, which we greatly appreciate, but then for 20 years, you did nothing to maintain the roads that connect those houses. Naturally, the roads have deteriorated, in some cases significantly, and the residents are not happy. I refuse to believe that's the outcome Doug Cole and you envisioned at the time. Ted, you're not some distant landlord. You are our neighbor. You live three minutes away from me. Don't tell me this isn't at least partially on you. We've talked this over. The funds exist. It's time to own up to the problem, do the responsible thing, and put this behind us in the rearview mirror so that we can all get on with our lives. Thank you. Thank you. There's another person. Please come forward. Uh, my name is Russ Tessier. I live at 8 Hopbrook Road. Uh, thank you for hearing me. I want to talk at a more personal level. So over the past four years, we've seen 13 children under the age of 10 move into our neighborhood, including my nine-year-old daughter. Over that time, I've seen the roads deteriorate. There's a, now a re relatively substantial pothole at the end of my driveway. Frankly, I'm concerned about safety. I've seen people swerve to avoid potholes, and in general, the roads are not getting better, they're getting worse. As my fellow homeowners have indicated, this is an issue that really needs to be resolved. We can't fix the roads. We're waiting for the developer to do it, and so far over 20 years, it has not happened. We're willing to put some of our own money forward to, to make this happen, but we need your help. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other people from the associate or from the neighborhood that would like to speak? Okay. Uh, Ted Parker, you have your hand up. I do. Uh, I'd like to respond to a couple of points that were made and to correct some mis material misstatements of fact. Uh, the last lot was sold in 2004. Uh, the road was completed to subdivision standards in 2004. It was inspected by the town engineer and there were not 10 items on a punch list. There were three minor items on a punch list. Um, so, uh, let me correct that. There, there, there were 10 items on a punch list. Doug Cole, when he was still alive, and Gloria McPherson, who worked for him, uh, corrected the majority of the outstanding issues with the road. There were three small items that remained incomplete. Um, I, 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 because Doug Cole died in 2010 and Gloria McPherson left the company shortly after Doug's death, I can't confirm anything other than what I can look, find in the, in the, in the record of, and in, in my conversations with the town engineer. But uh, Doug, for, I don't know why the ball was dropped in two, from 2005, 2006 through 2010 but the ball was dropped and there was a period of time where nothing happened. Doug Cole died in 2010. <clears throat> it was brought to my attention that the road needed to be, uh, the, there was, a, there was a, a three item punch list and that the, you know, that the, the road hadn't been turned over, hadn't been uh, taken over by the town in 2012. Uh, <clears throat> the owners, Doug's heirs, his widow and child, uh, had other things that were priorities. And it's true that the road, uh, uh, you know, has not been, the, the three punch list items after some discussion back and forth uh, were not taken care of. That's true. However, uh, and it is also true that Tofino still owns the road, but as Connie said at the beginning of her presentation, no developer is ever assured that a road will be accepted by a town. Uh, 
It's a quirk of Massachusetts state subdivision law that, and, and, and state law in general that no town is ever obligated, no municipality is ever obligated to accept a road as a public way. So there is no guarantee to a developer that a road will be taken. The only reason that the developer continues to own the road is to make it easy to convey it when time comes to actually convey it. So they reserve ownership of the road when they convey lots to make sure that there's just one simple deed so that the road can be conveyed. <clears throat> and the homeowners, when they bought their lots, each was granted an easement to pass and repass along that road, both uh, or roads, Kestrel and Hopbrook. It's unreasonable, if you think about it, to without any guarantee that a road can it will be accepted by a town, is, is a developer then expected to be responsible for maintenance of the road in perpetuity? Is it the developer's responsibility after having built the road to acceptable subdivision standards, is it is a developer's responsibility to, it, will it always be on the hook if the road isn't taken by the town? I, it, it's unreasonable to think that's the case. Um, so I, 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 this is a sticky situation. I, 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 I'm unhappy that it's come to this, um, but uh, I don't see it a, a simple way out. Uh, I mean, these houses have twenty-eight homes have been built on the on on these roads. They've been paying property tax for twenty years, uh, with the assumption that the roads would be taken by the town. I don't think that's an unreasonable assumption, and yet at the same time, I think the quirk of of real estate law and the quirk of subdivision law has resulted in this sticky situation. I, I want to be very clear, however, that that there was never a uh, long punch list item. And the, the, the things that need to be corrected uh, on this road, on these roads in order for the town engineer to be satisfied. And you can, you can if you wanna ask Jason about the three items on the punch list that he and I discussed in 2012 or 2013, I think he would confirm that that's the case. Um, um, the, 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 the items that need to get addressed now for the town engineer to be satisfied are not punch list items. They're not things that were left undone. The road was built to subdivision standards and was complete in 2004 and 2005. That's all I have to say. Okay. Are there, we're going to now move to council discussion. Um, Mandy Jo. There's a lot of history here, but I'm going to take the advantage that the owner of the road is here and ask the owner some questions. As the owner just said, every real estate developer when developing a subdivision takes a risk. They ask for a subdivision, they hope that their road will be accepted, but there's always a risk that it will not be accepted. And if it is not accepted, the owner of the road probably does need to maintain it in perpetuity unless it is sold or handed over to a different owner who would then need to maintain it for access. Um, can I Can I draw? So can I, I'm not can done I, yet. Excuse me. Okay. The Sorry. Counselor, what um, can conclude her comments first. So number one, as Mr. Parker just admitted, 
the 2012 list of three items that was left over that he spoke to the town engineer for was never completed. Mr. Parker, I ask you, why did you never complete those items? Um, and would you be willing to complete whatever those items are now or hand over the money that would cost for those items to be completed to the town? Number two, if you still own the road, why do you believe it is not your responsibility to maintain the road and remove the hazards that are currently in the road? Ted? Uh, the reason by analogy, owning a piece of property and granting an easement for another party to use that property does not create an affirmative obligation on the owner of the property to maintain the property for the benefit of the party who has the easement. Let's imagine, for instance, that you own a piece of property that has a bridge on it over a stream, and you have a neighbor who wants to use that bridge on your property to access their property so that they can farm that th their, their property. <clears throat> and they do that for 10 years or 20 years, and then that bridge fails. Are you obligated as the owner of that bridge to rebuild the bridge for the benefit of your neighbor who uses that bridge to farm their property? You're not. So many developers, when they convey lots out of a subdivision, they convey the lot and then the ownership of the road is conveyed in small pieces to each person who each each property owner who owns their property so they own to the center line of the road directly in front of their property in this case the developer Doug Cole reserved the fee in the road reserved ownership of the road simply as a convenience so that later on when hopefully a deed was created, it wouldn't be a deed from of many small parcels of a piece of road from each homeowner to the town, but it would be a single deed from a single owner, the developer to the town. Some developers don't retain the fee in the road. They don't retain ownership of any of the road. They convey that ownership of the road to the individual homeowners exactly because they want to avoid this kind of discussion later on. To the first point, Tofino has said many times, and it, it, I don't think it's, I, I should have said it when I first spoke, that it is willing to complete the three punch list items that that have been outstanding for some time. One of them has actually corrected themselves. <laughs> it doesn't even exist anymore. Uh, but Tofino, yes, T Tofino is willing to do that work and Tofino is willing to walk away from the guarantee money that exists, that, that is on deposit with the town. It, 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 Tofino has said that since 2012, since it first came up. But Tofino didn't want to do that work and then be in the same situation where it was a moving target where three things were done and then the town said, yes, but there were these other four things. Yes, but there were these other eight things. Yes, but there are these other nine things that need to get done. And that's what appeared to be happening. So without the ability to come to an agreement that there was a definitive punch list that would end the process, Tofino put off doing the work. And we're, we're now at this juncture. But I wanna reiterate, there is, uh, Paul can confirm, because he and I have been back and forth about it, the exact amount, but it's something like in the neighborhood of $40,000, $30,000, no, $30,000, that is specifically connected to the Meadows project. And the $120,000 was mentioned at the beginning. Well, the reason, and I think that it wasn't, the, there was no council then and there was no town meeting. I mean, it was town meeting, but I think the planning board is the one who 
who who decided that thirty thousand dollars was or twenty thousand dollars was going to be enough because the punch list had been whittled down to just a few small things that money was sufficient to cover the three punch lists the three item punch list that existed at the time so i think it's a material misstatement of fact that there was somehow this magic hundred twenty thousand dollars that was supposed to be set aside to 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 cover a bunch of work there wasn't a bunch of work there was just three small punch list items and again from 2004 to 2010 i have no idea why it wasn't done i'll be perfectly honest i can't figure it out but the global financial crisis happened in 2008 doug cole got very ill the ball was dropped clearly um Tavino has been willing to collaborate. I've had multiple meetings with the Homeowners Association. I've had multiple meetings with Paul. I've, had, I've spoken to Connie a number of times. We're not unsympathetic to the situation, but there's also a limit. And, and no developer is in perpetuity responsible for maintaining a road for the benefit of others. It simply is, it's irrational to think that a, that any developer would ever develop anything and agree to be on the hook for the maintenance of the road into the indeterminate future. Uh, Pat. First of all, to the other homeowners association, we're not gonna conflate them, okay? but. Beware, <laughs> beware of the of the person that you're dealing with, and hopefully you will not face them. I want to uh, ask, uh, thinking about your analogy, Mr. Parker, you said if um, you owned, you know, I was a neighbor and I owned a bridge that allowed another neighbor to farm <clears throat> on their property and the bridge collapsed was i would would the first neighbor be responsible no but in order to live together in order to collaborate those neighbors could get together and share the costs of replacing that bridge because both parties would benefit from the bridge it seems to me that you're saying i don't need to collaborate I don't need to do anything because the homeowners uh, group has offered to pay money, to pay a third of the cost. The town has offered money. The only person or entity that is saying no is, is you as representative of the larger company. So uh, why wasn't the full surety of $100,000 paid initially? And I asked that both of the town and, and Mr. Parker. You want me to answer? From your perspective, Mr. Parker, sure. I, I have no idea because I wasn't part of the decision-making in the company when that happened. It happened, don't in, have records? it happened in 2004 before I was responsible for any part of this company. I can only know what I know from looking at the record. And I heard no such thing until it was brought up by Connie Kruger at during one of the meetings that we had together. Mr. Bottle. Yeah, so we don't know why either. I mean, the people who are on this call who are representing the town were not here or were not a player in this. So there's just no evidence as to why that those funds were collected at the time. If they had been, if it had been collected, if the responsibility was by the developer was followed through on, that money would be available to repair the road. It's very simple in, in, in a naive kind of way. So it does seem to me that the developer who didn't pay the surety is responsible for fixing the roads. He's, and especially since you have a group of people 
who have purchased homes and are trying to live there and are willing to take money out of their own pocket to help solve the problem. And instead, and the town, and I hear the town saying, we're going to help. What I don't hear is the developer, and I would love to know uh, whether or what kinds of regulations there are, because they do own the road. If you have th things that are endangering children, I, I, or you know, you have collapsed uh, sewer lines, it's, it, it's it's kind of ludicrous to say, Mr. Parker, that your organization is not responsible. Did you have any further comment, Paul? Um, Jennifer. Um, well, I do have to say, I, I, I agree with Pat. Um, it, if the developer owns the road, it does seem that's the chance you take that the road may not be taken by the town, but you, as long as you own it, you own it. But I have another question. It sounded from the homeowners association that even if they were to raise all the money, is this true for to repair the roads, that they can't repair it because they don't own the road? Is that correct? Yes. Right. So, I mean, talk about a catch twenty two. If the developer is saying they own the road but they're not responsible for repairing it, and the homeowners association can't repair it even if they were to raise the money. I mean, we just have to find a, a, a solution to this. So if the surety wasn't collected, but the developer agreed to pay it, why couldn't that be paid now? And if it were, were to, it seems like it would be, if the developer were to pay at the same cost that it was 20 years ago, and inflation, we didn't you know, raise the cost to keep up with inflation, that would be a good deal for the developer. And if we took that amount plus what the town, plus what the homeowners association has raised and the town is willing to put in, would that get us close to, it's now at $400,000, that's what we're talking about? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Is so with that. If I can, please. so the town engineer last year was asked, what is the absolute minimum amount that of repairs that would have to be made that he could get to recommending acceptance of the road now this is from this is probably like eight months ago so again i'm not sure what the condition we, we do know there's been some degradation of the road since then uh the town engineer has made numerous lists of punch lists um at different times during this process so i think you know i think that we've been working with a four hundred thousand dollar number so that's jennifer yeah so could we get close to that if the surety was paid. And it seems if the original, if there was only three items on the punch list, but they were never done, then that might've led to degradation that would cause the next punch list to be longer. But um, I agree with Pat, the owner of the road continues to bear responsibility, even if they didn't expect to own the road for so long. Thank you. Ted, you have your hand up? Yeah. There is no catch-22 because if Tofino would gladly convey ownership of the road to the homeowners association if they would be willing to accept it. So the idea that the homeowners are not free to pay for ha having the road repaired is simply not true. And I, I know that this runs counter to people's intuitive sensibilities. But the degradation in the road is caused by 20 years of, and, and the normal lifespan of a paved road is 20 years. The, the degradation of the road is caused, you know, mainly by the use of the road by the people who live there. And I'm gonna repeat that Tofino is still willing to do the three punch list items, which were outstanding all that time. In addition to, contributing the thirty to $40,000. And again, please ask Paul to con confirm exactly how much it is because it has in interest accrued, et cetera, et cetera. But in addition to 
uh, forfeiting the 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 thirty thousand dollars plus that the town holds to guarantee Tofino's performance. So it's willing to do the work that it, that was outstanding, the actual work that was outstanding. It's willing to do that work, and it ha once it does that work, it's willing to walk away from the money that was set aside to guarantee that work. It's just not willing to pay for one third of the degradation of the road, which is caused by the people and the homeowners who actually use the road. And I, I again, I'm going to repeat at the risk of you know being redundant, the the ownership of the road does not create an affirmative obligation to maintain it. For the benefit of others it i know that sounds brutal it sounds you know and i i i'm not going to take personally anyone's you know uh <laughs> um uh, any counselors uh warning to others to be careful about who you're dealing with i mean clearly that was that was directed at me and i i i, I you know it, it's ad hominem but i i'll you know i'll i won't take it personally um I'm I'm protecting the interests of the people who who are the owners of of Tofino, and it's it's uh, I'm sorry that it sounds as brutal as it does, but I'm I'm just being direct about it. And frankly, you know, I, I've been hoping that well, I, I don't want to conflate the two projects, so I'm I'm not going to bring up Amherst Hills. I, I take that back. I'm done. Sorry. I still wanted to keep this surety on the table as a consideration, even if that 30,000 was to be de deducted. But that could be future. The FINO was not going to add any additional security. The surety bond. It, the FINO will not pay any additional security bond, surety bond. Um, so I have my hand up. I wanted to check again. How much was the surety supposed to be for 120,000? Yep. Please come forward and answer that question. Uh, Douglas Donnell speaking. Um, I have a copy of the minutes from the planning board. Let me just get to the right document here um uh february 7th 2001 um item b lot release request to meadows the board received a request from tofino associates uh, for the release of lots 8 20 23 at the meadows subdivision uh, Mr. LaCour explained that the developer needs to provide surety for the remainder of the work to be completed. Estimates for the amount needed to be provided by Tofino Associates and the, and the town engine. Excuse me. Um, estimates for the amount needed were provided by Tofino Associates and the town engineer. Uh, Ms. Ellen Stutzman, representing Tofino Associates, said that their estimate was probably higher than the town engineers because they included some extras. Mr. Hartwell moved the board that the board require $130,000, $10,000 per lot for the remaining work. Mr. Coldham second, and the motion passed unanimously eight to zero. Thank you. So the Homeowners Association is willing to put up $140,000. Tofino, as far as I'm concerned, still owes that surety bond. I want to know, Mr. Bachman, whether we can bill them. We can bill anybody if we have the authority to do that. Whether they pay is another question. And if they don't pay? There's not a lot of recourse. I mean, it depends who, I think, where this seems to be headed is depends who wants to hire lawyers to go to court. OK, 
Okay, I'm going to go on call on my other counselors. Andy. Yes, uh, staying for a moment on where it was, and then I have one other topic to add, one question to ask, a different topic. Uh, it seems to me that Tofino was expecting to pay that sum that was the $10,000 per lot that was to be sold. And by failing to pay it or failing to have it collected by the town has become unjustly enriched by that amount of money. And therefore, it seems to me that it should be rather embarrassing to Tofino as a business that wants to maintain the confidence of the community that it has allowed that unjust enrichment to stay with it and not benefit the homeowners and the um, to make sure that the road was completed in a manner that um, was uh, anticipated. So um, I, I I just am not accepting uh, the the argument that uh, is being made on Tofino and Associates' behalf. For that reason, um, I understand that the road has deteriorated because of the delays that are here. And had it been accepted in an orderly fashion at the time, because that money was paid, that the town would be bearing some responsibility for uh, repairing the road that, uh, to the point from where it would have been at that time to now. And I, so I'm not saying that the town shouldn't um, contribute the appropriate amount, but uh, it still leaves the fact that the Fino has been unjustly enriched. The question that I have for Mr. Dinal is that in your um, letter to the council dated February 5th, 2024, you say, and I think this is the fourth paragraph, of, uh, um, accordingly, we ask that you consider taking an up or down vote on accepting our road as is before, before approving any pending requests from Tofino for acceptance of other roads as public ways or the release of associated lots of funds withheld by the town. Uh, the part of that sentence is that uh, for acceptance of roads as public ways, um, uh, other pending requests, was that, what was that intended to mean? They don't want to, they don't want us to accept Amherst Hills. Please come forward. I guess I want to clarify that sentence. We we perceive that the only leverage that we have at this point are the lots that Tofino owns that are unfinished in Amherst Hills. We do not, whether you accept Amherst Hills roads or not, in a sense, now I understand, I mean, at the time we were just looking for leverage and the only leverage we see is because obviously Tofino is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a economic um, decision. And the only thing that's of value that's left, we have no leverage because all the lots have been released. You guys, the town held a bunch of lots and that got Tofino to, to, to act on Amherst Hills. Uh, I don't know what else happened in terms of legalities, uh, uh, but we just felt that we wanted to express that uh, the town consider the possibility of holding whatever lots are remaining undeveloped in Amherst Hills, owned by Tofino, not by the homeowners, uh, to put a restriction on them as a way to encourage Tofino to finish our roads. Uh, we do not want to block 
Amherst Hills from the, their process of acceptance per se. We're just trying to find a resolution to our situation. Thank you. Thank you. Then follow-up question goes to the town manager or uh, the planning department director. And that is, uh, are there, are those lots on the cul-de-sac at this point owned by Tofino or have they been sold elsewhere? Go to Chris for that. Chris. Yeah, I believe the lots on the cul-de-sac are, um, have not been released. So um, those are still being held, yes. Okay. Andy, that answers your question. Yes, and I think that the uh, implication of the questions that I was asking is obvious that uh, the uh, question also is out there as to whether accepting the um, roads in Amherst Hills that have been proposed uh, can be separated from release of other lots that are still owned by Tofino until there is a resolution to this problem. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. George. I'm sorry, Councillor Ryan. No, I, I, I'm trying to better understand the town's role on all this, um, though maybe in the end it doesn't really matter. But um, it does seem not unreasonable to expect both the homeowners expected and the developer expected that these roads would be taken over by the town. And while that's not a certainty, it's not an unreasonable expectation uh, because it's happened every single time, as far as I know, in this town and happens in many, many other places. So it's not unreasonable expectation. Certainly the homeowners had that expectation. The developer had that expectation, but it never happened. So I'm trying to understand why it didn't happen. Um, and maybe, I, I don't know if there's an answer to that question, but it never happened. Also, there was a surety um, and it was never collected by the town. Um, yes, they didn't pay it, but is there evidence that the town actually asked them or came to them and demanded payment? Um, I'm just wondering what the role of the town was in all this. Do we know, have any answers? Is Everyone has gone away and we don't know the answers? Or why wasn't this ever taken over by the town? The, Paul. the answer to that is that because the town never voted to take it over. I mean, it, it, it takes an affirmative action by the the by the either the town meeting or the town, town council to accept the public way. Until then, it's a private way. The town has no responsibility to accept the public way. And I know what you're saying, but you know there's always risk involved. And, those, and that risk is built into the pricing of the land. Usually when you, when you purchase something, you know there's a risk factor that's involved with it. But all that being said, and all you know, the history of this, that's why I was willing to, in the negotiation, believe that the town had a commitment to put some funds into this, but not to own the road entirely and have that suddenly come on the on, onto the responsibility of the town. That didn't seem fair to the other taxpayers in our community either. But you know, I think it's a discretionary decision by the town of Amherst. The town of Amherst never made that decision. You're being asked to make that decision now. Pam Rooney. Thank you. Um, I thank Andy for the comments that you just made. I did take a look at the uh, at the property map, and there is no evidence at all that the that the lots extend to the center line of the road. They clearly stop uh, outside of the or at the 50 foot right of way. So th there is no clear indication to any landowner that they somehow own a piece of the road. Thank you. Mindy Joe, I'm going to skip to Anna since you've spoken once. Okay. Anna. You don't have to. I skip Mindy. I I have 10 paragraphs of half started notes because this is nuts, right? This is nuts. Uh, there's a difference between a moving target and negligence. And I get that the ball was dropped, but that doesn't mean that the game was stopped, right? I understand that, but this the company still has an obligation to do this. And now at this point, if we do the bare minimum, we're impacting all of the residents of the town by adding a street, which seems like it's going to be in need of more repairs very, very soon, pushing back possibly the needs of others. 
I have a question, um, I think for Guilford maybe, which is as you look at the history of these punch lists, is this normal wear and tear? Or is there something more that we need to be worried about in adopting these roads in the future where this punch list keeps growing and growing? Um, I think what I'm what I'm struggling with is the idea that the you know the the bridge analogy threw me a, a little bit, uh, Mr. Parker. I'm not going to lie to you because if you built that bridge in order to sell that person the farmland, feels like you should probably maintain the bridge. Um, and my biggest takeaway here, because I have ten paragraphs of started notes and haven't been able to finish any of them is one of the follow-up actions I think we as a council need to take is advocating our shifts either in our own bylaws or at the state level for increased clarity around ownership of private roads and maintenance of them. Um, it seems to me that there's uh, some sort of loophole that seems to be located here that that um, is causing this scenario, this situation. And I think that there's been some absolutely dropped uh, drop balls all over the place, but it does seem that we as a council have some obligation to for the residents of our town to clarify this responsibility and and seek some shifts in Mass General Law or our town our town bylaws regarding maintenance of private ways that necessitate access to homes. Councilor Haneke. I just want to go back to some of the stuff that I asked, but you know, everything Andy said and Anna said, and basically everyone else has said, I think is where we all kind of are here. Um, but Mr. Parker, you keep saying, well, I'm willing to do those three punch list items. It's been 12 years and you haven't done those three punch list items. What is stopping you from doing them now? We can't, I don't think anyone can trust your word at this point that you're willing to do it when you've had 12 years to do it. And an indication potentially back in 2012 that if you had done that three punch list items, that the road may have been accepted by the town select board or town meeting or whoever does the select the, the, I think it was the select board as keeper of the public way um, that it might have been accepted back then your indication that you claim well it would have been a moving target at that point basically has no basis in reality right now because you never did those three punch list items back in 2012 when you said you were willing to do it and here we sit 12 years later without you having done them yet. So I wanna know what is stopping you from showing some good faith in these negotiations by completing the three items that you've already said now in a public meeting that you're willing to do. And then if you weren't willing to maintain the road, could you indicate why you took the risk a known risk in 2010 or whenever you bought Doug Cole's company, when you knew or whatever happened there, you were aware that Mr. Cole had kept ownership of these lands, that they were not sold as part of the lots to the midline of the intended street, but they were kept and the risk was kept not with the owners of each individual lot, but with you or Doug Cole as developer and whatever happened between when he died and when you guys, you, I, I don't know the history of the company there, but whatever happened, that risk was there that you took on. Yet from everything I've heard tonight, I haven't heard anything that has, that you've said that shows that you'd make that that there's some good faith there that you're willing to help because of those three punch list items have not been completed in 12 years. Mr. Parker. As soon as somebody says, as soon as somebody agrees to take the road when we finish the three punch list items, we'll we'll do them. But there's never been a representation that that was the case. It's always been, well, but then there's this other thing, and then there's this other thing, and then there's another thing. And I'm 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 I want to be, I want to correct a few 
uh, assumptions and misstatements. I didn't buy anything from Doug Cole. It's still owned by the estate of Doug. Stefino is still owned by the estate of Douglas Cole, by his heirs. I, I, I've never had an ownership on it. I don't own anything. I'm, I'm merely representing their interests. Um, the, the, regarding the surety, the $130,000 surety, that was, if I remember the quote that was read aloud from the minutes of a meeting in 2011, it was at 130. Um, by the time the surety was actually presented, I think that the punch list had been whittled down to three items. So the punch list, the surety that was provided by Tofino was sufficient to cover the three items that were outstanding at the time. And I want to be very clear about punch list is a term of art. A punch list exists. It's things that need to be completed to finish the job. It things that that degrade later are not part of a punch list. Those are things that happen later. They're, they're, I, it's, 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 those are, that's degradation of the road. It's, it's degradation of, it's, it's normal wear and tear. Um, that was not ever to be part of a punch list and you don't add normal wear and tear to a punch list. It, it, it's, it's not how it works. Um, and insofar as conflating uh, Amherst Hills and the Meadows were permitted under two separate permits. Using one to ensure performance in the other. Uh, I mean, I, I'm going to ask actually ask Michael Pill, I, our attorney, who is at this meeting, I believe, to address this issue because um, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't believe that that you can conflate the two and use one to uh, to uh, uh, guarantee the other. Uh, Michael, are you here? Can 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 Michael Pill be added to the panel? Athena, I'm going to ask your opinion on this. It, it's up to you if you'd like to bring that person in. Bring them in. We might as well put the whole trial out. Attorney Pell, you've been asked a question. Thank you. Can everyone hear me now? Sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, what concerns me here is the inaccuracy of the understandable intuitive assumptions that counselors are making. It is what's called black letter settled law that the owner of a road, the land under the road, number one, has no obligation to repair or maintain. Number two, the holders of the easement who are the lot owners do have the legal right to repair and maintain the road. What concerns me and we need to do some more digging here, is how was it that the town released all the remaining lots in this subdivision without collecting the, the $130,000, okay? Those people were not incompetents, they were not fools. I think that supports an inference that what Ted has suggested is that the work was done. And what we need to do is go back and see where the were lots later released without collecting that money. And those records should be hopefully both in planning board minutes and in the registry of deeds. But the final question I want to address is I think the subdivision control law is very clear that lots in Amherst Hills can be withheld from release only for completion of work in Amherst Hills. So far as I know, and I've been doing this since the 1980s, I litigated my first subdivision case in 1986. 
there is absolutely no legal authority for the town to conflate two subdivisions two subdivisions and if there's other legal issues i'd be happy to speak to them um i've been sending ted a barrage of emails you know citing court cases for example um on the the fact that the owner of the road has no obligation that the holders of the easement have the right with respect to the comment about the plans don't show the lot going to the center line that's not the issue here that's chapter 183 section 58 of the mass general laws called the derelict fee statute um in other words i i understand you know you're you're educated smart people your reasoning from intuition and your sense of fairness um, as you see it, but the law simply does not support uh, many of the, the suppositions. And, you know, if you want me to put it in all in writing with citations to legal authority, I'd be happy uh, to do it. Um, the fundamental problem is what I always tell people, if you end up in litigation, you have one certainty, the only sure winners will be the lawyers for both sides, me and KP Law. I think they probably never met a lawsuit they didn't like because that's where the big money is. So hopefully some peaceful, rational, lawful resolution can be found. And everyone may not be happy, but the subdivision developer who completes the subdivision requirements imposed by the planning board has completed their obligation. The notion that there is somehow risk or the developer has continuing obligation, that's based on the erroneous assumption that ownership of the road carries some obligation. Um, the, and and the, it, the, the counselor who pointed out that it was the lot owners who took the risk and should have been advised of that by the attorneys who represented them, that is exactly the situation. I mean, once Tofino completes its obligations under the sub subdivision control law, acceptance of the road is um, a completely separate process. They're completely separate chapters in the general laws. And the counselor who suggested, I think very insightfully, that um, what she has identified is a gap in state law. Um, I don't know if she has any legal training, but she'd make a very good lawyer because that is exactly what the situation is. That is that is a hole in Massachusetts law. And if there's other questions or concerns, I'll be happy to try to um, uh, address them. Thank you very much for listening. Guilford, you put your hand up. Yes, I just wanted to say that I agree with Mr. Pill, but he said that Mr. Tofino has completed the subdivision. The agreement that Mr. Tofino or Tofino Associates entered into with the town, the planning board process, as far as the, the public works department is concerned, and I believe the planning department as well, I can't speak for them, he has not completed that. <clears throat> they never completed the three items on the punch list. As time went on, more things came up. And that's how this grew. I'm complete in agreement that we need to come to some type of amenable agreement. That's the only way to solve this because there were a lot of balls that were dropped in this process. But Tofino Associates has not completed the agreement they set up with the town and the subdivision process. Anna, you had your hand up. I appreciate your compliment, sir. I do not have legal training, but I'd like to be clear this is a hole in Massachusetts th law that you are exploiting to the detriment of our community members. I would like to advocate for a change so that this can never happen again. Uh, my question is for Guilford. Have we ever given a deadline on punch lists? Because I feel like that feels also like a change that we might want to start doing. And, no, and saying they expire at a certain point. No, that process is kind of open and it's never been a, a deadline put on a punch list. Normally it's taken care of pretty quickly. Mr. Mr. Cole's um, situation is probably something I've never seen before, even doing this in other communities. Okay. Councillor Haneke. 
No, I will be quick because I want to just reiterate what I believe Guilford just said, which is, um, I think the crux of this situation is that there is a disagreement between what attorney Pill said and what the homeowners believe and what the town believes, which is that there is no evidence that Tofino has actually completed its obligations under the subdivision control law. There was a punch list, that punch list was never done. Now that punch list has changed because the obligations under the subdivision control law were never completed by Tofino Associates. Oh. Um, and I think that is the crux of the dilemma that we sit here now is there is a disagreement as to whether those obligations have ever been completed and the town and the homeowners association believe the answer to that is no, they have not. That's Briefly, please proceed. I, I'm sorry. Ms. Chair, that was meant for you. Yes. Th thank you. Thank you so much. Um, what I think is being conflated here, the planning board released all of the lots and all of the lots were sold. That documents and confirms that as far as the Amherst planning board was concerned, Tofino did indeed complete all its obligations under the subdivision control law. The punch list that's being talked about here concerns acceptance of the road as a public way. That's my understanding of that punch list. That is not the responsibility of the developer. If indeed it was, then the planning board would not have and should not have. Um, in fact, one of the one of the people, uh, you know, I knew some of those people. I've been active through this period. Um, Fred Hartwell was one of the smartest, most knowledgeable planning board members this town has ever had. I, I, I don't even know if he's still living, but um, I tangled with that planning board more than once and they knew what they were doing. And at that time, the I believe the town attorneys were Bob Ritchie and Alan Seawald. Mr. Seawald is now the Northampton city solicitor. They also had first rate lawyers and nothing got by them. When a later town manager um, who's long gone now foolishly fired Mr. Seawald, I, I wrote to the paper a thank you note for eliminating- Please, we need to phone. conclude. I'm sorry, thank okay. You. Thank you for your, for your time. The key issue is public way acceptance was completely separate from subdivision compliance. Thank you. I'm gonna do the math one more time. Tofino owes the town $130,000. No. You may not think you owes a, owe us that, but in fact, any company that realized they were going to owe that would have made sure the money was there. No. The ha town, the Homeowners are planning to come up with their share. The town is willing to accept its responsibility and come up with its share. We need Tofino to step up. Bob Hegner. Um, I just want to say that we're, we're where we started an hour ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we haven't really made any progress. We're at an impasse here. And we need to figure out what we can do to break the impasse. And I don't know what that is, um, but other, if we don't break the impasse, we're just back to square one. Is there a motion? I mean, the options are to accept the roads. At that point, the town and the homeowners are on the hook for everything that's left. Another option is to not accept the roads, at which point the homeowners again have lost.
I'm open to other options. Councillor Haneke. So Paul's memo had um, eight items, three of which it, his memo indicated that if we wanted to go potentially forward, that there were eight items that we might want to request, mm -hmm. three of which from the owner of the road, um, an as-built plan, a title certification listing the names of all persons who own the road and the grants of easements to the town done at the owner of the road's expense in proper legal form. I don't believe we have any of that right now that Tofino as owner of the road would need to provide the town. And then from the town engineer, there was five items too. So I would recommend that if we want to continue this discussion, we maybe seek all eight items before we continue the discussion further. So you're going to move that we do what? Um, I guess it would be moved to direct the town manager to obtain the items in his As memo well. to the town um, prior to the council considering this item again. Is there a second? Second, Rooney. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions? Uh, George. If Mandy or someone could help me understand how that is going to move the ball down the field. Uh, how will any of this information help us address what seems to be this impasse, um, which seems to basically require us to have some leverage over Tofino. Um, how would this advance that cause, or would it? What's um, this information? That so for the sake of discussion, could I ask the town clerk, I mean, the clerk to the town council to put the memo up on the board and specifically go to that list of eight items? So some of it is to, if I may answer the question, mm -hmm, please. Some of it is from the town engineer about what condition the road is in and the cost of bringing it up to speed. Right now we're operating on a cost level that's two years old. And so that might help us get a better idea of, and of what our real choices are um, as we discuss this further to try and move things forward. Is the town manager's memo the last page? It was a next steps if the town council is inclined to move forward with this acceptance of public ways, the town council, the council should request the following. I'm waiting for the item to be placed up on the board. George, you have your hand up meantime. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking out loud, which at this hour is probably not a wise thing. Um, there's also some legal, I mean, questions about what could be done on a legal level. Um, trying to understand what leverage we have. Um, if we were just to take this, if we would have a vote, up or down vote right now, and take this road, we would be on the hook for a sizable amount of money. On the other hand, it would solve the problem of the homeowners who have absolutely, they're not responsible for this mess. Um, so it seems like we're, we're, we're struggling. I mean, we're not gonna resolve it tonight and maybe I should just shut up, but um, what information could we get? That's a question. 
um, that would help us see more clearly what our options are, other than the option tonight of simply adopting this road and absorbing the cost. Athena? Okay. So, Mandy Jo, your motion would be to direct the town manager to, to obtain, obtain the, the following. items in his memo to the council prior to considering this item again. Okay. That motion's been made. Is there a second? All right. Second. Further discussion? Uh, George, you have your hand up. Ted Parker, you have your hand up. I do. Uh, I would like to say I appreciate everybody's willingness to work hard on this. Tofino is clearly happy to provide A, B, and C at its expense. Uh, I think that the as-built plans are already pretty much done, been done for some time. And title certification and the easements and the deed, uh, I think I, I think you have to add a deed as well here because in order to take the, the road, the, a deed will have to be drawn up. Um, and in addition, um, uh, because we have conflated the two projects, I will address the, this outstanding issue of Amherst Hills uh, there was a $25,000 value punch list of items at Amherst Hills that was negotiated with the town engineer and the planning board um, that Tofino has completed in to guarantee performance in that Tofino put up $50,000 that is still on deposit with the town. The town has not returned that money, despite the fact that Tofino has requested that it be returned. Um, because Tofino did, in fact, complete the punch list items in Amherst Hills. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's been a, 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 a somewhat nettlesome um, uh, lack of response on the part of the town in not returning that money to Tofino, um, but understandable. I am going to request that Tofino rather than asking for that money to be returned from the town, that Tofino uh, contribute that money to the, the cost of, the costs that have been discussed here tonight. And uh, although it may not bring the total amount of money that Tofino will contribute up to the sum that, uh, that uh, the town manager has suggested it will add it will, it will more than double the amount that Tofino has uh, been willing to contribute to, to this point and I, I will uh, check with the owners and I will um, suggest to them that that happen and I will uh, confirm that quickly and get back to uh, the town manager about that in the next 48 hours. Thank you. Did that make sense? Other... We appreciate that piece like more, but we'd appreciate that much. Are there any other questions or comments? We're going to move this to a vote. Seeing none, I'm going to start with Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. In can you just very clearly tell me what I'm voting on? What you're voting, I'm sorry, it's been taken down. What you're voting on is the list of eight items that appear at the end of the town manager's memo to the council. And it, it's under next steps. And the motion is to direct the town, count, the town manager to proceed with that. And uh, then bring this back to the council. Uh, the motion is to yes, direct and I'll the just town make manager one to obtain the items in the list. It's to obtain the items, yes. To obtain the items in his memo to the town council prior to the council's consideration of this item again. Okay. And okay. Kathy? I, I'm a yes. 
I think this is what we asked them to do two years ago, but I'm a yes again. Okay. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Reluctantly, yes. Anna Devon Gothier. Aye. Councilor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Jo, uh, Councilor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Yes. Councilor Lords absent. Pam Rooney. Yes. It's unanimous um, with one absent. I want to thank you all and hope that we are back here in a very near future to accept this road. Thank you. We're going to proceed with the rest of our items unless somebody on the council wants to make a different decision. We have to do. Yeah, we also. Yeah, right. Okay. I yes. Yeah. And I think I better we can quickly do them all, I think. Okay. Uh we're going to go on to item um C and I'm going to ask um Sam McLeod, who is patiently sat in the back of the room. Uh, Sam, you've given us a wonderful presentation. Could you save the presentation for the actual finance committee meeting? I hate to do that to you, but I have the feeling we're wearing thin. Okay. Thank you. We, we owe you one. <laughs> we're, we've already voted. Are there any questions that the counselors want finance committee to think about as they look at the CPA recommendations. Kathy. I have two, and I think the third is tied up with our discussion on the fields, so, so on the regional fields. So Sam, in two of the proposals, one is, um, for the Historic Society House to do a structural assessment. And two years ago, uh, a little bit more than two years ago, CPA gave them $18,000 for a structural assessment. So my question is, why are we seeing it again? Sam, so, come on up to the mic, please. So, so I don't need an answer for that right now because I am on finance, but I... I I double checked it was called the Simeon House in one and then it was called this and it's the same place and it was similar. So I don't know whether they used the 18,000 and then they found they needed more for other reasons. And it was in the FY23 package and I'm not sure you were on CPAC at the point that went through, but I, do, I just don't remember. So that's question number one and question number two is the Mount Zion Church or the Zion Church, the North Amherst Church. Um, if you look at it from the outside, the whole building is in not great shape and the congregation is small. So I don't know how CPA assesses that if we do the roof, do they have enough money to maintain and repair the rest of the building? Or is it, you know, we've done the roof, but now there's the walls and there's other parts of the building. It's a huge, beautiful church. Um, and with the same church, if we do this money, is it, does it always have to be a church? Um, so if they can't run it anymore, 